Hi everyone, I'm Shirley from SCAPE. Uh, glad to have everybody from our judges to the mentors and of course our graduating batch of students. Uh, since the last uh, kickoff on the 16th June, we have seen you guys actually work very hard to get this project going. And uh, I think I will not say too much. I'll leave it to uh, Prashan to help us to go through the whole agenda. But please, you know, uh, be very prepared to reach out to us because Scape is here to help you to further your dreams. And, uh, and we as a team will also continue to have the conversation with you. Over to you, Prashan. Thank you, Shirley. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Prashan Saxena. Uh, I belong to iCynthia. I'm the head of Insights and I'll be a moderator for today. Uh, thanks, Kay, for organizing uh, this event, and thanks to our students as well as judges and mentors for being a part of this larger event. So this event is all about hacking the new normal, and it's a virtual hackathon that you are uh, witnessing right now. Uh, we have about 77 participants uh, actually as audiences, and then we also have students as well as judges, mentors, uh, organizing team as part of the panel. So what we will be doing today is uh, culminating this hackathon and the final day. But since a lot of you might be joining us for the first time, let me share some context on why we are doing this. So essentially there are two needs happening in the society right now. One is with the SMEs. Uh, we saw because of the impact of COVID, uh, SMEs who contribute to about 50% of the country's GDP were impacted. And it's not just food SMEs, you also have smaller SMEs like let's say a learning studio or let's say a small retailer. All of them were being impacted and we have seen that there have been four rounds of budgets to really buck up in terms of having our game up and also having the SMEs go up. On the other side, we had students. Now we had graduating students. So just imagine that you have gone through the four hours, four, four years of your graduation uh, you have also seen the frameworks as well as audited classes or being part of your coursework. And now you are staring at this COVID era. Uh, things might look potential downturn as MAS is predicting, and we should be prepared as students uh, to enter this economy and how we can contribute better. So we have two essential needs happening in the market, SMEs being impacted and graduate students. We thought with this hackathon, we'll bring these two needs together. So as graduating students, you would look at using data to solve problems of SMEs that are facing today. What you'll be seeing today would be about the case studies. In these case studies, these are more hypothetical case studies uh, as a generic representation to the actual industry. So we'll be talking about these case studies as we go into the hackathon. Now, in terms of what you can expect to get out of this hackathon is all about get inspired from practical data-driven solutions. Uh, we all know that there is a death by webinar happening right now. Uh, we wanted to make it a little different by sharing that what are those practical tips and tricks at the same time, what sort of data should you be looking at to solve these challenges? Also get pragmatic as you have six different judges and five different mentors coming together as well as Scape and Icynthia team uh, who will be sharing their views as they react to the student presentations and also taking some of your questions. And then you can ask some of these questions to the hackathon judges and mentors uh, towards the end of the presentations and really sort of understand what they are thinking about. I'll also share with you some context. Now, today is day nine of this hackathon. So we started this hackathon on 16th of June and we started with a kickoff. It was more of a smaller event wherein we looked at kicking off. So Scape kicked off the hackathon. We had mentors and judges introduce themselves and we did a briefing for the students. Then day two and three were all about mentors and students aligning and talking about what the case studies are and how mentors were helping the students approach the case studies. Day four was a masterclass when I sent their team came together with the students to run them through the social data as well as search and audience data. Why this data? Because this data evolves over time. And as this data evolves over time, how can you imbibe this data in the case solutions and come up with something more current? Day five, six, and seven were all about student teams using this data, working on these case studies. And finally, they presented, 15 teams presented to the mentors, and we had five teams as the final shortlist. Today is the final, and these five teams will be presenting. 
Now, what it means to you is you can actually get to know these are life consultant guys. So you can actually see the sort of passion as well as data driven marketing they will bring to the table. And you can also see the reactions of the judges as they actually help these students hone their skill further. So this is what we'll be doing today. We had the introduction. Uh, we'll also just take you through our judging portfolio as well as our mentors. There'll be a short speech by Senior Minister of State, Ms. Simhan, and then we'll go into the presentation of shortlist teams. As judges put together their points for the, uh, for the teams, we'll be doing audience Q&A as well as a judging panel. This is where you need to ask your questions. We'll announce the winners and we'll close by 5.30. All right, so without further ado, the judges, welcome judges. Welcome Megan from Circles Life, Walter from Kempsinki Hotels, Vivek from Record Penkaiser, the brand that owns Dettol and other portfolio, Bernia from Jones Lang LaSalle, James from Icynthia, and Vishy from Johnson & Johnson. Welcome judges. Then we have our mentors. Ed from ADK Network, Ping Ping from Google Business Review, Google Business Group, as well as the lead for Women Builds SG, Leon from Get All Myanmar, Susan from Microsoft, and Elaine, who is the head of branding. All right, so let's get into what the Senior Minister of State, Ms. Sim An, has to say about this hackathon. Hang on, let me just share the video again with you. Hello everyone, my name is Sim Ann, and I'm very happy to be addressing you at the final round of Hacking the New Normal. And this is organized by Scape. I'm very glad and heartened to see so many of you here contributing good ideas and working together with partners to think of ways for us to live and work better despite COVID-19. I think the world needs the ideas of youths. Singapore needs the ideas from youths. And to have so many of you come together, I think is something that's extremely precious. And I want to show my appreciation for all of you for joining in this initiative. The experiences of our young people during the COVID-19 pandemic, I think is going to be something which you're going to remember for a very long time. Yours will be the generation that came of age in the middle of a global pandemic. And at the same time, I think you're also coming of age at a time when you can contribute so much more to your families, to people around you, to the community in coping with COVID-19 because so many of you have the ideas as well as the skill sets to make a difference. A very good example of that would be your skills in the digital arena. With COVID-19, businesses, organizations, individuals, so many of them are trying to go online and also to digitize whatever they've been doing. And I think young people are very well placed to help them with this. I also hope that our young people can make full use of the various measures that have been rolled out to help our Singaporeans with their employment and employability. For instance, we have known that four budgets were rolled out in quick succession, amounting to nearly $100 billion. We have also, in a very rare move, used our national reserves for this purpose. And I hope that our young people can make good use of all these opportunities to upskill, to take part in traineeships, all of which you can find under the SG United Jobs and Skills Package. And at the same time, because so many of you are brimming over with good ideas, please also make use of the initiatives under the National Youth Council to work together with like-minded friends and peers and to bring your ideas into reality. For instance, we are setting aside $30 million from the National Youth Fund to help support projects and initiatives that are related to themes that we have been developing under the SG Youth Action Plan. At the same time, we have also made changes to Young Change Makers Grant to allow grant disbursement 
to be easier and faster uh, in view of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, it remains for me to wish all of you the best and also to thank SCAPE for organizing and also to Essentia for their support. All the best, everyone, and have a great hackathon. All right. Thanks a lot, Minister. And uh, that was the Senior Minister of State for MCCY and MCI, Ms. Sim Han, talking to us about this hackathon and wishing us all the best. All right, so let's go back to the agenda and let's start to look at how we can go about doing this hackathon. Sorry for some, there's some technical glitch going on. Just give me a minute, please. All right, so we, without further ado, we'll get started with the presentations and this is how we will run this. So first of all, thanks a lot to the mentors for really coming together with our student teams and helping them shape up these case solutions. Once these case solutions were done, we selected one team for each of the SME issue that we have. So today you'll be seeing five teams present to you and they are the finalists. From this finalist, we'll shortlist the last three, the first three teams as the winners. But having said that, really congratulations to all the five teams because you guys did a good job by making to the shortlist and also to the wider teams uh, for their hard work. As in nothing is going to go waste, we will be using all of your case studies with your consent and sharing it back to the SMEs. That's what matters. It's not just about the audience here. It's also about the wider organizations and associations we'll be sharing it with. So the first one would be about dance studio and I'll share with you what this case study was all about and then the students will start to share the screens. So this will be team one. Team one, be ready to share your screen, all right? So the case study is all about an SME owner called Peachy Lee and she owns a dance studio. Now, when circuit breaker was happening, she incurred heavy losses due to the, due to the classes got stopped. And then you had phase two and three. Now in phase two and three, it is likely to open, but she has to operate with a limited capacity. Now with this lim limited capacity, there are issues in terms of limited demand and how much she can charge for a class. Everybody told her, hey, you should go Facebook live or Instagram live and do your classes. Tried that, but didn't really work out because the viewership was low and the engagement was not much because a lot of other SMEs as well as global conglomerates were doing this. Students have an option to look up for the dance tutorial on student for uh, on YouTube. And that was another competitive set because you know that if you need to let's say exercise or do a dance, you can actually go to YouTube and watch a video. So if you're running something more live and high touch, what should you do? And that's where the challenge came in. If you are not able to operate in full capacity in the near foreseeable future, how should you pivot? And this is where our team one would be helping Peachy Lee innovate, adapt, and survive. Over to you, team one. Please share your screen. Okay. Let me share my screen first. Yes, please. We can see your screen, Nicholas. Please go ahead, go in the full screen mode and get started. Okay, good afternoon judges and mentors. We are team one and we'll be taking you through our presentation on hacking the new normal in dance. So here's the presentation outline for today. So a little introdu introduction about us. We are a team of seven dancers from our university dance club, SMU Eurythmics, and we were once part of the 16th executive committee together. Having been assigned this case, we are really excited to create solutions for dancers made by dancers. So from a dancer's point of view, what are dance studios like before COVID-19? So for a start, we like to go to dance studios as they offer a platform for us to improve our craft. Also, we sign up for multiple memberships across different studios and purchase various dance packages. We book classes through self-service apps like MindBody. 
And last, we learn more about the studios mainly through social media channels. So as dancers, we might go for open classes to learn a one-off choreography of a certain genre, or we may sign up for dance courses that occur through several weeks to learn dance techniques progressively. So to gather more about the dancers' sentiments, we conducted a survey with 113 dancers to find out more about their opinions on the key elements of dance as a service. So this workout here actually represents our research. So from the survey, three key aspects were uh, highlighted, environment, social, and learning. And these are then translated to the following three points as seen here on this slide, which are studio space, atmosphere of community, and the dance instructor. So unfortunately, as with many others, dance has changed for both dancers and studios when COVID-19 struck. So from the once packed physical in-studio classes, so dance studios have now op uh, adopted online platforms to conduct classes. So key activities of dance studios remain, however, adapted to two formats online. First would be tutorials where dancers will learn from a pre-recorded video. And the second format would be a real-time one where instructors teach the classes remotely through platforms like IG Live or Zoom. So the problem with moving on to the online climate is that it opened up its own set of challenges. So the dance studios not only face local competition like dance people and recognize, but the global ones as well, especially those with strong online presence like movement lifestyle. Also, from our Google Analytics research, the wane in interest over time for local studios shows that the challenges that Pacey faces as a studio when she's adapting her classes online. So we, from the case brief, case brief itself, we've identified two main problems. One, a reduced cash flow due to low viewership and engagement. And two, the limited operating capacity due to phase two and three regulations. With that, we have come up with the problem statement. To create a business transformation plan to adapt to the current environment while ensuring that it's scalable and sustainable for the long term. So to adapt to this climate, we actually formulated two short-term strategies, which we believe will allow us to act in the near immediate future. So we have, we have listed down our objectives, okay? And strat ones help us to tackle our first objective, which is to optimize the current market. So strat one is effective in-studio scheduling to optimize the revenue stream from physical classes. So let's assume a typical scenario in a dance studio. So PC Studios has three instructors. A, B, and C, with respective average demand of 32, 16, and 10. So under phase two regulations, each studio is only allowed to hold a maximum of 10 students. So this is the hypothetical situation that we are working with. So before scheduling itself, which is what is happening now, for any given time slots, one instructor will be leading a different class in each studio here, A, B, and C. And assuming all classes are filled, the average demand per instructor will be 10 students. However, after scheduling, the instructor with the most demand, which is A, will be allocated three studio spaces. The lesson will be broadcasted from the main studio to the other studio spaces, which is seen here, B and C. Instructors with less demand will be allocated to other time slots or being diverted to online channels instead. For a given time slot, the average demand per instructor has now improved to 30, making this strategy viable to act upon. So on top of that, we believe that this proposal will work because one, from our survey, it shows that 90% of the dancers still prefer in-studio classes. And two, this helps to reduce the consumer uncertainty by providing more slots for highly demanded class. It's also extremely feasible because there's existing available technological resources and PC Studio can leverage on the existing physical studio spaces. The benefits of this strategy is as such, minimizing costs, optimizing demand per instructor, and channeling resources more effectively. So now that we have optimized the current market, let's move on to our next objective. So to get a clearer direction, we have decided to gather insights. And from the data provided to us by Essential, we have found out that dance is well associated to these keywords, which is around the topic of health and wellness. On top of that, from scholarly articles, it's shown that dance is for one's well-being improved cognitive and physical health, which translates to improved productivity. So for everyone here, if you haven't been dancing, it's time for you to start so. So short-term strategy two is, PC Studio can provide wellness services in the form of dance sessions to organizations. 
we are proposing a shift towards a B2B model where PC Studio can provide specialized dance packages to employees, stakeholders of an organization. To decide which organization specifically, we look again at the data available to us and our understanding of the current climate. So from essential data, one of the hot topics is definitely on migrant workers. There's an increasing awareness among public masses regarding the improvement of their welfare and living conditions of these workers. Moreover, in phase two, the movement of these workers are restricted due to quarantine measures. As such, there's a need for them to seek forms of activities to keep themselves occupied. Thus, we have identified this potential market to be migrant workers. So why is there a strong one for this program? We actually conducted primary research in the forms of interview. So one, resources are well available for such wellness programs. So it was mentioned that there's budget set aside to roll out such initiatives. Exactly. And two, across key operators who have great understanding of their workers, they strongly believe that there is a strong interest among migrant workers for such programs. So on the case of feasibility, three points. One, ease of execution. There are many instructors available. And two, high engagement rates of migrant workers through DOM initiatives. And last, the current climate of COVID-19 provides great potential for high participation rates. Now we'll move on to the case of viability, where we'll be looking at some numbers to prove that this is justifiable for PC Studios to act upon. First, we'll look at the pricing model of this B2B model itself. So taking reference to a Zumba corporate program, which we believe is one of the closest competitor, our dance class will be priced at $280, regardless of the number of students. There is a soft limit of 40 per class, as we believe that this is the optimal size per class per instructor based on our understanding of the dance industry. We'll be looking at purpose-built dormitories and the average number of workers per dormitory will be at 1,500. We are assuming a conservative engagement rate of 5%. And as such, for weekly demand, we'll be looking at 75 packs. And based on the soft limit itself, we'll be teaching two classes per week at the dormitories. We will now need to estimate the significance of these weekly DOM classes and we'll be comparing it to the weekly in-studio classes. So let's take a look at the table here. For a typical dance studio like Pei we are estimating the number of dance classes taught will be at 30. And the number of people per class will be kept at 10, which was the same as our strategy one. Each class will be priced at $10 and the total weekly revenue will be at $3,000. So we will now compare the weekly DOM uh, revenue to this uh, weekly revenue itself. And we can see that it is substantiated to about 20% of the entire pie. So what does this number mean? This means that this strategy is significant and scalable. It's easily transferable to other markets with large market size, and it can be, it can be ramped up quickly to obtain significant revenue streams. In this case, catering to the, dif uh, to the different dormitories available. As such, short-term strategy two is extremely viable and profitable for PC to hop on. Now I'll be passing the time over to Ken, who will bring us through the rest of the deck. So Ning has covered the short-term strategy. Now let me go through the long-term strategy. But before that, let's do a recap. So first, we looked at market data and research, and we gave, reacted to these insights we made from, and formed two short-term strategies that will lead to benefits for PT Studios. However, as dancers passionate about this community, we wanted to do even more. We believe that being reactive is not enough. So we went back to the data and research and took a proactive approach to come up with a long-term strategy to benefit PT Studios even more. With COVID restrictions dampening what was a vibrant dance community, we hope to breathe new life into it by reinventing the new dance in Singapore. With that in mind, we looked at the data available to us, and after a qualitative analysis of the 130 responses of the survey, there was a common theme among them. What drives a lot of dancers to dance is their common interest in, sen in the sense of community. And this is further backed by research studies that have shown that human beings have an evolutionary need for affiliation with other humans. Therefore, even with studios reopening in limited capacity in phase two and the foreseeable future, we believe that this need for community will remain high among dancers, and therefore we want to be proactive and provide an avenue for dancers to build this community. With that, our long-term strategy is to build an online community through an application. Let us introduce to you our new proposed app, Groove. Imagine Groove, a mobile application by PTD Studios. Get on and get connected with news within the dance studio, training classes offered by the studio, and engage the studio communities who share the same passion for dance as you. 
discover what your favorite instructors and what your friends are up to as you earn personal badges and rewards by staying on the application. As you review your own calendar, you may also look to book additional dance classes that you might be interested in and even opt to stay updated on future up and coming classes. Alternatively, you may also pick tutorials of your own liking to build your own dance skills, saving these videos for a future reference. At your own free time, you will review these videos and start the learning process at your own pace. The self-directed learning is enhanced through the various navigation features on the application. You can also view friends who have attempted the same tutorials as you and look to discover other tutorials that you might be interested in. Further, you can engage with dance community by joining a group and participate in various community-led activities that the groups may have. All these features within a handy mobile application such that where you cannot dance offline, you can still do it online. Wow, looks amazing, right? However, an app in the dance community is not new. Currently, dance studios in Singapore are using the MindBody application to allow dancers to book their classes online. Even so, we believe the Groove app is far superior. Why? Let's compare their functions. Firstly, MindBody app allows people to book classes. Well, so does the Groove app. On top of that, Groove still has all these extra functions, some of which include community building and key features that were designed for dancers by dancers. Speaking of key features that benefit dancers, here are some that we have included in the application. Such features include a mirroring function which flips the video horizontally to make it easier for dancers to follow along too. It also includes a looping, speed and view function as well. Overall, we believe that this app is desirable as it has user interest. This app fills in the gap left due to the limitations of physical classes and aims to create a community which is shown to be extremely important to people. Additionally, PT Studios also has the ability to further encourage user uptake. This can be done by marketing the app through instructors. A social media audit of 15 instructors in Singapore shows that their average level of engagement on Instagram is 7%, which is much higher compared to the average Instagram engagement rate of 2%. This app also has elements of gamification, like a progress bar and badges, which research has shown helps to boost app participation. We believe the app is also feasible as it's is tapping on existing resources on the studio's instructors to record the tutorials and allows them to hone their teaching skills. As for the app development itself, there are grants available for the studio to take advantage of to outsource an otherwise high cost of development. Examples of such in grants include the Enterprise Development Grant. As for how viable this app is with regards to its sustainability, adopting a freemium model has a good potential to return profits. And this is supported by an empirical study of purchase behavior in freemium social games. This potential is even better with the inclusion of social features in freemium games like the ones included in our app. In conclusion, Overall, with PT Studios being hit by COVID and struggling to provide dancers with what they want, our group suggests the following route to success. In the first two to three weeks, PT Studios should adapt and reschedule their physical classes. Then, in the next two to three weeks, lay the groundwork for starting to provide the wellness services in the form of dance sessions to organizations, specifically migrant workers. These strategies will take place in the span of roughly 1.5 months. Concurrently, the studio can also start to lay the foundations of the Groove app development, following which will be the further development of the application, which overall, the development of the minimal viable product will take about six months, with continuous testing and development of the app afterwards. While COVID is currently proving a challenge to PT studios, they can overcome it with these three key takeaways. Firstly, they can meet the dancers of, in the current market, then expand the dancer community by diversifying the appeal of dance. And thirdly, by combining these two approaches, they can establish a new normal of dance that dance studios and dancers like us can embrace. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Nicholas and team. And since you were busy presenting and bullet training towards the end, uh, to the extent that you were wrapping, uh, that's what my team is telling me in the chat on the side. Um, I could tell you that the judges were smiling as you were presenting. And it was so heartening to see that we had dancers solving problems of dance studios. So over to you judges. Before that, thanks a lot, Eileen, for really helping shape up this case study uh, and for your inputs, because otherwise it won't be possible. Really good effort, guys. Level A effort, I would say. Thank you. Over to you judges, questions, please. Yeah. Hey, hi, uh, my name is Vishy. Nicholas and team, I think, first of all, really well done. I think uh, you've explored really some creative solutions. And I particularly like the idea of the quarantine migrant workers in terms of uh, doing things for them. Uh, I like the fact about the app. Of course, there are some challenges in terms of the time scale of implementation, etc. But 
but really well done. I think it is looking quite nice. Uh, there is just a couple of uh, one question I had. I see in, in managing a business, particularly, right? I think what you need to do is first of all, of course, you want to optimize revenue, but at the same time, you need to manage costs because it's the cash flow that typically kills an SME, and you want to ensure that hey, your costs are optimized during this period. So, wanted to check. I think in addition to optimizing all of the revenue sources. Uh, did you have any thoughts in terms of how you will better manage the costs during this time? Okay, I'll be answering this question. Thank you for your question. So I think uh, we really uh, thought about it from this approach, like really two-pronged approach where we want to increase revenue and decrease costs. So for the cost-wise, I think it's more applicable for our strategy one itself, uh, the effective uh, scheduling. Because what we are looking at is, is we are not increasing the demand actually, but we are trying to minimize the cost per instructor because we're trying to sort of like fulfilling the lost sales here. Yeah, because instructor A, I think was mentioned earlier on, uh, he has the most demand, but because of phase two regulations, it's kept at 10. But I mean, compared to instructor C, which has only 10 uh, students for his demand of the class itself. So what we are doing is we are just playing around with the scheduling itself and we are obtaining more people and we are cutting down on the uh, cost per instructor. Because based on our understanding is each instructor is uh, paid a base price and commission on the number of students that attended their class itself. So by reducing the number of instructors taught at the physical studio, we will be uh, looking at reducing the cost incurred. Got it, got it. Thanks for the answer. Thank you. Hey guys, uh, Sai, this is Vivek here. Um, excellent work. Uh, congratulations to the mentors who guided you in coming to this solution. This looks really exciting. Um, and, and I think the way you've, you've crafted the story, both short, short term and long term, which is good, this is exactly what's needed. Um, um, and long term means that you're changing the face of the industry. This is what disruption is. So, and COVID in a way gives us that opportunity. I'd just like to call out on the cost part. And I think Vishid, you asked a great question on, um, on the cost aspect. Uh, so why, when we reduce cost in this difficult time, um, reduction of cost also means human capital loss, which in a way is not beneficial for the economy. So, so let's say the cost will have different uh, you know, heads. Human capital is one of them, which are dance instructors, but then you also have the studio rental cost and so on, uh, and electricity and possibly upkeep and maintenance and all these things. When I saw your solution, you know, we also proposed that you can let go of certain instructors. What can you do of maintaining the instructors, but yet maybe figure out other ways to reduce the cost and not actually uh, you know, lose uh, employees? Because you know, as you said, your solution has other ways of diversification. So why um, go for reduction in manpower? Okay, I'll just answer this question. Thank you so much. I think, um, uh, I think there's a sweet spot between our strategy one and two that there's a tie in. So when we try to divert the instructors from strategy one, which is the effective uh, scheduling itself, we can divert it to strategy two, which we can uh, propose that they will be the ones teaching the classes at the dormitories itself. So in that case, we are utilizing the resources we have very effectively as well. Yeah, so I think uh, yeah, that is answering that. How are we using this capital itself? So yeah. the worry, of, sorry. Yeah. So the worry of losing human capital is kind of solved by um, our strategy too. So yeah, whenever classes that they lose out in the physical classes, they are actually topped up by the exist uh, additional corporate classes that we are planning to introduce. Yeah, and as for the the studio space itself, it's because I think uh, we are trying to back it up with like the demand that we forecast from their regulars and we want to optimize each studio space according to the highest demanded class itself. And with that itself, I think, yes, like we can rely on grants and everything that are available, but essentially the cost is already incurred. It's a sunk cost and we just want to spread it out across a larger space, which we are trying to optimize through this effective scheduling itself. Mm -hmm. See, one point, uh, Nicholas, to bear, right, is that the companies, right? You you talked about taking the dance classes to the companies. I think for the foreseeable future, you can imagine that most companies are going to operate at a smaller capacity while people still operate out of home. So the ability for you to monetize those kind of classes, at least in the in the near future, is going to be a bit more difficult. Yeah, because uh, uh, so I think uh, 
it's about hey where does my consumer reside and what is the kind of experience that they actually want at this juncture and you taking that experience to them yeah okay. so uh, it's just a, a random thought huh? i think like a, a company strategy right now might not actually be in line with what things uh, how things are and even companies will be extremely cautious right of having large scale gatherings in their own, uh, uh, like uh, campuses etc at this juncture so it's just a watch out as per what you're actually Okay, thank you for your insights. I think, uh, I think, in the future, let's say if we can work with a dance studio, I think then we will be hearing more about their concerns and perspective. And I think that itself, we can align our solutions and better tailor it for them. Thank you. Perfect. Judges, we can take some more questions because it's flowing really well. Hi. Good afternoon. This is Vernia here. Uh, hi. I really like. Um, the presentation, um, especially the, particularly the, the fact that you guys, you know, did think about short-term solutions that are quick wins and fixes, as well as obviously your long-term strategy of you know developing an app and all that. So, so to the app, I think like you mentioned, there are a lot of people who have a lot of studios who also have apps as well. So in this current climate, like how would you actually think of creative ways to sort of um, up the adoption rates or the download rates of your app? Okay, so for the adoption rate of the app, as we mentioned, it's um, going to be marketed through the dance studios instructors. So the higher engagement rate of our instructors is what we are hoping to pull in the, the students. So our experience as dancers is that when dancers go for their classes, they kind of develop this sense of community and sense of bond with their instructors. So we feel like the strongest thing that can pull people in into this application is their instructors. And I think the differing point about this application compared to others, like you said, is that uh, there, while there are a lot of existing applications, a lot of them are very, very functional. So we go onto the application, we put classes, and that's pretty much it. So wouldn't it be better or have, like, to provide them with um, a solution to not only have this functional thing in this application, but also better connect to their instructors to have this social aspect? I yeah. think uh, just to add on, I think uh, earlier on, I actually mentioned this application called MindBody. It's actually a sort of like an aggregated uh, app itself, a platform, and we feel that why not create an application that is catered for dancers by dancers itself. So we have an understanding of what this uh, community actually uh, want. Mm -hmm. Okay, but as for uh, the app development, I think this is whatever we mentioned was really a lot of fundamentals of mm -hmm. the basic features and all. But in the long run, it's like a building block where we can add in so many different functions and make it so uh, extremely attractive and viable for dancers in the community to hop on. I think really to give you one analogy that I can think of right off my head is that, I think imagine going to a library with 50 books, or would you rather visit a library of 5,000 books? I think the answer is quite obvious. And what we are looking at is that maybe this app, we can get other studios in, in Singapore mm -hmm. to hop on, to contribute to the, the library feature itself of the number of tutorials mm -hmm. available in this app itself. I think, of course, with that itself, we'll be giving royalties or commission to the different studios. But ultimately, this is one feature that we may be potentially looking at to attracting a larger fan base or a larger user base for this application mm -hmm. itself. So the, the opportunities are really quite limitless Yeah, once we roll it out. Yeah, so we hope we answered your question. Thank you. Yeah. I think it's also the fact that, you know, with apps and downloading of apps, I think firstly, there's a fatigue in what yes. kind of apps people want to download. And if I do want to commu uh, connect with the instructor, if I were a student, uh, it would probably be something that's more personable uh, yes. through either Instagram or even, you know, having a, a personal um, WhatsApp or a relationship or a conversation with um, the instructor. And it, I think the issue here is um, depending too much or banging too much on your instructors uh, following. Mm -hmm. uh, given that you did highlight that they have like demand for of like 32 people, for example, with instructor A. So I think um, thinking outside of the box that there needs to be some um, above the line solutions as well, rather than just, you know, uh, relying on organic uh, reach and engagement. And uh, yeah, it's, it also sounds like, you know, I know that the app is a, a way to diversify the revenue stream, but I also feel like it's moving away from the original uh, brief of creating um, a case study or rather the, the, the marketing case study for the actual dance studio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is just my comments. Yeah. But overall, I, still, I, I think it was a good job. Thank, thank you. you. Well thank you, judges, and thank you, Nicholas and team.
Uh, we have an overwhelming number of questions coming in the chat, but we are going to respect the time. So what we'll do is, Nicholas and team, we'll share the questions back to you so that you can further refine your case solution. Overall, it's a really good effort. And thanks again, Eileen, for helping them out. Thank you, guys. And Thank I'm going to show you back. Thank you. And let's go into the next one. So we move from Dan Studio to eSports. And this is our eSports organizer. All right, so what's the case study? Tim Co owns an eSports event startup and he has recently started hosting uh, uh, in physical eSports. And what he's trying to do is he's trying to do friendly matches and tournaments. Now he was quick to adapt to online streaming as gaming streaming around the world has been up skips in viewership. A lot of people are watching it, uh, but he needs to strategize for the long-term challenge. And this is all about going back to the roots of the negative perceptions around esports. People think that esports creates addicts or has a limited career option or a role. Uh, so it's a double whammy situation. First of all, the, the career choice has got negative connotations and then you have COVID on top of it. Then you have the problem of getting talent to participate in tournaments. Maintaining online viewership uh, after COVID-19 crisis eases. So the challenge was to come up with creative solution to help him sustain his business in a long term. Again, going back to the double grammy. So team six, let's start presenting the screen. Over to you, please. Okay. Um, um, I can't share the screen right now because there's a, sheet, a screen is being shared, right? Yeah, you can just take over. Uh, um, okay. Try again? This one. Can you all see? Yeah, perfect. Go ahead. I'll be starting now. So very good afternoon to our judges. And today my group will be showing you guys just how you can hack the new normal with eSports. So in our team, we have me, Anting, Sean, Gladys, and Matthew. We will first start off by covering the objectives and needs of Tim Cole, followed by the key trends and opportunities in the market. And then we'll introduce our three prong solution and end up with our implementation and marketing strategy. So what are we trying to achieve with our solution? Let us first start out by understanding who exactly Tim Cole is and what are his objectives. So Tim Cole is currently an eSports event startup organizer whose revenue stream traditionally comes from mainly sponsorships and advertisement, as well as media rights, streamings and merchandise. But due to the COVID-19, his business model has shifted to hosting mainly online tournaments and friendly matches. However, because he was quick to adapt to online streaming, he has been seeing upticks in viewership. But he has to develop a longer term strategy for when the COVID crisis eases, and this manifests itself in four objectives we have identified. So sustaining online viewership, diversifying his revenue stream, recruiting more talent, and changing public perception of esports. So as shown, COVID really has changed the game in many ways for Tim Cole. So what is key here is that the new normal is digital and the online population is burgeoning and hungrier than ever to consume digital content. With this new normal, we have identified three key areas and opportunities. A growing esport industry, resulting in a greater demand for jobs. A shift towards digital content by consumers, allowing brands to achieve deeper digital engagement and maintain top of mind. And thirdly, working from home as the new normal, which creates a need for a new platform to conduct corporate team building events. So now we look at some data which led us to these areas. According to a Newzoo report, eSports report, eSport audience growth is expected to have double digit growth year on year till 2023. And media rights revenue has grown rapidly as well, almost doubling every year, which shows that the eSports industry is still growing exponentially. And we can expect to see a parallel rise in demand for jobs in this industry. So since our consumers are increasingly going online, Non-endemic brands have capitalized on this trend, shown by the increase in collaborations such as this BMW and LV, actively engaging with the industry through in-game outfits and creating creative content with the goal of achieving increased brand reach and consumer engagement. Lastly, the shift of focus onto working from home, which is expected to be a new normal. A report by Upwork predicts that 73% of all departments will have remote workers by 2028, and furthermore, with the likes of Facebook and Twitter announcing permanent work from home options even after COVID, there is definitely a paradigm shift in working arrangements. So here we have derived our three key personas. 
first, we have a ban, a working professional of the work from home population who needs to find a way to keep his team together and bonded. And we have Julia, who enjoys watching esports in a leisure time and now craves newer and more engaging content. And lastly, Jesse, an avid esports gamer who wants to continue his career in the long run and hence delving into more technical aspects of the industry, such as streaming production. So the target market are as follows. The global online population, represented by Benjamin and addressed by our first solution, corporate e-bonding. The, the global esports audience, captured by the Gaming Talent Co. and our casual viewers like Julia. Julia. And finally, the academy for our esports enthusiasts like Jesse. So our solution is a three-pronged approach targeting the three key areas identified earlier. Firstly, a corporate e-bonding venture, using games as a platform to conduct team building activities for organization. Secondly, the Gaming Talent Co. that focus on talent management and content creation. And lastly, the academy, which offers accredited, flexible courses needed in the esports industry. And there is synergy in this solution as students from the academy are able to apply their skills to real life projects from the other two areas. So let's look into our solutions uh, and our solutions in a greater detail. The corporate e-bonding venture is a one-stop solution for all virtual team building events, offering professional event management, tapping on Team Co's years of experience in hosting esports events. The library of games offered will include a multitude of games, from online board games to hyper-casual games, in, additional, in addition to traditional sports title, esports title. So this allows us to capture the growing online population that might not have already might not have experience in esports. So why hyper-casual game? Hyper-casual games are lightweight games with simple mechanics, and they are categorized by instantly playable, but infinitely replayable characteristics. Some of the more prominent games from this genre are Flappy Bird and Crossy Road. So as shown in this graph, the number of downloads for the top 20 games in this category has increased about six times between 2015 and 2019. So the next addition we are planning to add is online board games, which is a market that is currently largely untapped and has recently seen an explosion in interest as seen by a sharp rise in searches for online board games in Google Trends worldwide around March when the lockdowns were introduced. Okay, so next we have the Gaming Talent Co, which is the talent management arm that builds a portfolio of content creators that help secure brand partnerships and collaboration opportunities. This portfolio will be used to create creative content to sustain online viewership. And the type of content plan covers esports industry as a whole, rather than just the players. So for example, branded content and behind the scenes of the industry. So the additional aim is to shine a spotlight on the industry as a whole, showing that there is more to esports than just sitting in front of a computer playing games. So using Essentials data, we created a work cloud in Python of all the times consumer brands such as Singtel appeared and included Dota and Overwatch as a benchmark to show that these brands are getting mentioned with a similar frequency. Additionally, there's a slight increase in mention of brands in the social media data between April and June, showing that there's a growing significance in both endemic and non-endemic brand collaborations mentions in the esports industry. So here we have a short example of what kind of behind the scenes video content we intend to create. Have you ever been curious as to how much work goes into making an eSports event work? Well, look no further. eSports Academy will show you what goes on behind the inner workings of an eSports event. So with all eSports events, it always has a main control room to control all the stream output, input, and the spectator, the replay feed. All of these are done here. Without this department, Esports streaming wouldn't be that well represented. Computers, mouse, keyboard, gaming chairs, good setup, all of these are necessary for esports event. Gaming lounge, resting areas are also required during. Oh, shit, sorry. Um, okay, yeah, that was just a short snippet. I will move on to the presentation. So, our final idea is the Academy which targets the global esports enthusiasts and to meet the demands of this burgeoning industry. At the Academy, we will partner with SkillsFuture SG to provide WSQ certs for graduates, giving more credibility to the esport profession. And what differentiates these causes is that the Academy will teach students, uh, will be taught by the very industry professionals whom the esport, the fans of these esports uh, know of. So, and most importantly, they get to choose the causes based on content and length. So over here, we created a work cloud for various skills related keywords and essential social media data and derived insights into popular skills related to esports. 
Therefore, the modules the Academy support will include optimizing health for sporting performance and business skills in the esports industry. So just like the aforementioned two change strategies, the third strategy is born from an opportunity we spotted when analyzing the data. We found that people are expressing an in increased interest in esports earnings, price rewards, and upgrading their gaming rigs. And so this suggests that there's a general interest in wanting to develop gaming competencies. Similarly, there's an increase in profitability of the increased interest in the profitability of the industry, shown by the increase in keywords related to profitability, suggesting an interest in the esports industry as a profession. So this shows the market for causes on skills related to the esports industry. So next, we have identified some institutions in Singapore that currently offer game-related courses, such as Informatics Academy, NYP, and DigiPen. However, the focus is still mainly on game design and game development. So how we differ in the academy is that we want to allow students to explore other areas, such as event management, production, and they get to get an exclusive opportunity to be taught by industry professionals themselves and get to apply their skills to real-life projects from other solutions. Furthermore, these short flexible courses are more accessible than full-fledged diplomas, allowing students to just try out the course and then if they're not ready to commit to this, kind, this line of profession, they're free, they free to continue with their original plan. So lastly, successful graduates will be able to boast a WSQ cert, showing that there is more to the industry than just playing games and then boosting their employability, even if it's not related to esports. So moving on to the final section, how are we going to execute our solution and what is our marketing strategy? Our go to market strategy is designed to achieve maximum reach and be highly scalable. So for the academy, we are going to be combining both offline and online channels, especially at the current educational institutes, which have some gaming courses such as Nanyam Polytechnic, as mentioned earlier. And additionally, we hope to drive uptake through peer-to-peer -peer recommendations and reference counts. The gaming talent core pivots from a mainly digital approach to aggressively marketing through social media, targeting existing personalities and talents in the industries who are actively, pre are actively present in the digital sphere and also have a large digital presence online. Lastly, our corporate team warning seeks to gain traction by partnering up with existing team building event agencies so that we can tap on the existing client portfolio as well as more traditional B2B marketing channels like LinkedIn. This is our initial budget approach, which focuses more into reach and traffic, as we want to drive penetration and demand generation, rather than focusing on the return on ad spend. Subsequently, when we have gained traction, we will shift to a more bottom funnel consideration conversion approach. As for the geography split of budget, APEC is forecasted to be the largest digital gaming market in the world, and Latin America is one of the fastest growing markets for video games, with Argentina, Brazil and Mexico leading the race, and is expected to have a CAGR of 11.4%. In order to determine which platform to focus our strategy on, we perform sentiment analysis on comments and forum posts from essential social media data. So posts containing the word Twitch, YouTube, Facebook, and Mixer were filtered out and fed through a sentiment analysis model from TextBlock. Each post was given a polarity and subjectivity score, which describes how positive or negative it is, as well as whether the content is an opinion or factual one. The results were then plotted on a graph as shown in the slide. From this data, we found that Mixer has the highest positive sentiments associated. However, just as of yesterday, Mixer has joined Facebook, so our solution will be targeted at Facebook Gaming instead. And at the earlier stage of the purchase journey, we found that blogs, music streaming services, and podcasts were the most common channels used for brand discovery by gamers. And hence, we will use channels such as SiteDirect for 100% share of voice, and creative assets such as audio ads to cater to the podcast and music streaming services. Microblogs such as Twitter also perform well with gamers through combining the word of mouth branding with the transient, easily digestible nature of the tweets. Display ads such as Programmatic and GDN, as well as more commonplace social media sites like Instagram and YouTube, will also be used to drive awareness to capture a larger audience pool. And as mentioned in the previous slide, we will be focusing more on Facebook gaming, or also, known as, uh, also used to be known as Mixer, which saw the highest positive sentiments. And then for our bottom funnel strategy, we will shift our focus to our AS and conversions for our KPIs, as well as retargeting and lookalike audience for uh, our targeting strategy. So here are some challenges and risks we have identified. So for corporate e-bonding, there are currently very little online team bonding games. Hence, we tend to tie up with existing bot game platforms to leverage on their current portfolio. And for our talent management arm, 
though it might be tough getting talent on board with us, we plan on addressing this by aggressively reaching out to both talent and potential brand partners to social media sites as mentioned earlier in our digital marketing strategy and also tapping on team post connections in the industry. Lastly, our course material might be circulated to non-students for free in the academy, so this might dwindle our profits and the number of prospective students. So we'll mitigate this by having a secure course platform that is made accessible only for the course duration and removing the download function for our material. Our action plan starts off with initiation, where we'll start securing partnerships, designing the course structure and creative content. Next, our better launch starts off with onboarding our first intake of students for the academy rolling out our first batch of creatives content and the launching of our online team bonding platform. We will then take some time, just about a couple of months, to understand how our users have been taking to our solution and incorporating their feedback for our final launch. In terms of future development, we plan to develop our own platform to increase scalability for the global market for our corporate e-bonding solution. Similarly, for the Gaming Talent Co, we want to expand our reach to international talent and brands, perhaps like in South Korea, China and Argentina, to create a greater synergy with improved content and gamers. For the Academy, we want to tie up with accrediting institutions such as Polytechnics to lend more legitimacy to our causes, and hopefully we can change public perception about the industry and subsequently attract a larger pool of students. Lastly, we want to incorporate some sort of social good into our solutions, which could be done to either donating part of our revenue or upcycling our lesser or less new laptops for the less privileged. So and with that, we have come to the end of our presentation and hope to have showed you just how to hack the new normal in eSports. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. And thanks a lot, Leon, as a mentor, how you shaped up um, this challenging case study on eSports. Um, just give you snippets of the side chats that you are having and given a choice we would love to hire all of you i don't know about the judges but yes there's some really good data analysis happening there so hint hint we might be earmarking you <laughs> all right so over to you judges uh, especially the judges who weren't able to ask questions in the last round last team uh, any questions from your side I'll, I'll jump in, Prashant. Um, thanks, guys. Um, same, same as the last um, presentation. I thought that was that was really good, thorough. I liked some of the data visuals that you that you had in there. I'm a bit of a geek at heart, and um, I like my esports as well. So uh, this is this is a topic that I, I enjoyed watching you present on. Um, I'm interested in the platform. Um, you, you've mentioned that you're going to build your own platform. Have you thought about? Um, the costs of that platform, uh, the maintenance, and and also just some of the the complications that might arise from uh, from what it looks like from this presentation, launching it globally with some of the language functions. Um, just just wondering if you've you've had any thoughts around that. Um, I, I think I'll answer this question. So we did uh, consider the difficulty, and it's we understand it's a very challenging uh, proposition to create a global platform for, for this. So uh, it will be a long term, like a pretty long term solution. So this was for our future development. And we found a few um, like open source kind of platforms to support event management, um, to organize tournaments and this kind. So we plan to partner with them and then um, build onto their, their existing platform. Uh, or if we could find an open source code and then uh, our find these creators and then uh, work together with them to create a platform. Yeah, so that would be a more feasible approach for us. Okay, thank you. Well done. Thank you. Hi, I'm Megan um, and I have a question. If you had to describe, if I was a potential customer, why would your platform uh, specifically for um, the academy or corporate e-bonding, -bond why are you going to be better than any other solution out there? I think actually it's, um, we tried to search for current competitors in the market, right? Then we actually identified that there is not, uh, there aren't many competitors actually doing something, which is why we identified the key opportunity in this area and then designed the solution from there. So for the academy, right, it's, we realized that at least for the Singapore context, there isn't actually a, a ed educational institute that focuses on like perhaps the, the whole the whole industry. So from the end to end, like your event industry, your event management, your game design, game programming. So we want to have this like a 
all-in-one solution as well as we can tap on Tim Ko's connections in the industry. So assuming he has been in the industry for quite some time, right, he has definitely connections within the whole supply chain that he can use. So you definitely get professionals that are actually in the industry that are teaching you the causes. And as for the gaming, um, the corporate inbounding one, right, yeah. So current platforms, we, maybe you could say like Jackbox or like Psych, perhaps, yeah. It, there are not many games actually online, so there are quite few choices. And for Jetbox, I do know that you have to pay $15 perhaps for like five games and then like that's it, yeah. So what we're trying to do is to uh, combine multiple games into one whole platform and we're going to make the whole experience really frictionless where it's really easy for a team to just go on and like uh, engage in the team bonding activities, yeah. So we want to make it as frictionless as possible, which is why hopefully they can go onto our platform and enjoy the variety of games that we have. Um, okay, just, um, should I just add on a short point? Okay, so we wanted to tap on um, Team Co's event, um, experience in event management. So we're able to organize a proper event with proper production, with uh, streaming capabilities for, for the company itself. So rather than just coming online, uh, meeting at like 8 o'clock on a Thursday, for example, to play some games, but this will be more organized so we can involve more teams together. And furthermore, um, I understand that not everyone plays eSports, uh, not involved in eSports, and even so, they play different games. So we wanted, uh, an organ uh, we wanted to organize something where we teach as well. So we play very simple games, but we teach them, we show them how to download, how to get onto the platform, and then what's the game about, and then we conduct the game. So it's a one-rounded solution. Yep. Thank you. Any other questions from the judges? I think just a remark from my, sorry, we go ahead. <laughs> Thanks, Vishy. Uh, just to see, there is, uh, you have three solutions, corporate e-bonding, uh, the gaming talent co, the academy, uh, fabulous work. This is really out of the box thinking. We guys are new, right? We are not digital natives. So we are learning what the possibilities of gaming industries are. How would you stack it? How would you phase it? Um, where would you start first? Would you start with e-bonding? Where would you go? Uh, gaming talent co, the academy. This is too much work. This is all good work, but this is too much uh, for startups to start. The significant amount of money which will go um, and effort, and possibly you're going to bet on something which will succeed sooner. So you have capital to then go into phase two and phase. How would you phase it? Okay, I think I can take this question. So um, actually for all these three solutions, right, there's some sort of synergy happening in the sense that the students who sign up with us in the academy, they're going to act as like, interns and work on a capstone project for the gaming talent co and copper e-bonding. So for that sense, there's quite a lot of manpower that is going to be set up through these interns. So we can teach, we can start off with the academy first and teach them whatever course they need to know. And then they apply it to our gaming talent and co and copper e-bonding. So that sounds like half the better really. And then also for proper e-bonding, right? Like it's, I guess it's quite a similar issue where we just start off with, we want to start off with the, the platform building first. So maybe Sean can go back to the action plan slide. Yeah. yeah. So how we want to tackle this is the initiation portion. We're just going to start off with securing partnerships and then perhaps designing course content for the academy first. And then for our beta launch, um, what I guess we are trying to sort of launch uh, all three at the same time, but the initiation portion is really where we can put the foundation on and provide the synergy effect with the interns providing the extra manpower. Um, and then definitely we have our feedback and optimization. So we can have our, just put an MVP and then we, based on the feedback and feedback that we receive from our users, so do user testing in a better launch, we're going to incorporate that for our official launch. Um, just to add on, because we, we identified that there are a lot of people doing similar things, but not exactly the same. So we really want to focus um, our solution on partnerships. So for let's say the library of games that we might not currently have, we really want to partner with all the different platforms out there. Because some there, there's a few platforms, so there's uh, one or two for online board games, but they are focused on like having friends just come online to play. Then there's a uh, hyper casual games on the site, it's like all individual apps. So we don't want to create our own games yet. We just want to focus on these partnerships to get, uh, to get it all together. So we are more of like um, bringing everything together and providing the solution. And then with, uh, we, because the brief given to us was Team Co have experience in event man, esports man, um, event management. So a lot of these um, skills are transferable because they are similar, but a slight tweak for like corporate e-bonding. So it's similar skill sets and capability that we are talking about. 
No, I, I think it makes sense. It's it's a complete ecosystem, but maybe there'll be a need to prioritize the pet. Um, okay. Possibly corporate bonding can give you immediate revenues, uh, which can get things going. Something like in the cat wing is going to set you off for six to seven months at the point you train someone and then eventually they start managing events for you. I get the point that you're going to, um, you're offsetting the cost by getting trained students to support you in the corporate bonding games. And also, you may also have some of them coming into the talent company that you manage and possibly earn fee. It's a long-term play. So I think maybe prioritizing the bet of how quickly you can get in the market and start generating revenue would be good. Story. But this is a good solution. Really love it. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Let's go to Vishy for the last question. No, I think, uh, guys, uh, first of all, lovely work. I particularly liked, first and foremost, also the fact that you had different consumer profiles. Yeah, Knowing who you are going to target is a very, very important part of the entire journey. And I think uh, you had established that at the very beginning. So that's really kudos to you. I think I'm just building off on what Vivek said, right? I think, see, even big organizations like ours often, often have to prioritize things and sequence mm -hmm. things in order to make things work, yeah? Uh, in an SME, right, I think cash flow is going to be one of the most important things that you need to manage. And as a result, right, I think while you can have a roadmap that actually goes, goes uh, for a much longer period, you have to prioritize and sequence your events. Otherwise, you'll end up like having like a, a minor version of everything as a complete version of something that you can actually prioritize here. So it's just one of the watchouts, uh, but really incredible work and really fantastically done, yeah. Okay, understood. All right, just a gentle reminder to the judges that we are spending time to do Q&A. Uh, please do fill in your uh, point systems, yeah? So go back to the shared sheet, do ensure that, so that towards the end, we are not rushing it. And also, once the case studies start to keep filling in, you'll start to jumble things up in your head. So it's good to just mark them as and when. Uh, I wanna take a quick one minute break here uh, because it's case study after case study can be really heavy duty. So I want to just bring in Shirley from Scape team. Uh, Shirley, just want to see how are you feeling in terms of the solutions and just some of your anecdotes here. Shirley, I think you're on mute. Right. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I think the, the solution and the, the, the ideas behind are really good. Uh, in fact, when I was just uh, thinking through, even for the very first one that talked about the dance course, I would just imagine, yeah, despite the outcome for today, we have conversation that we can actually reach out to this youth. Uh, and, and I'm already thinking of uh, partners like old schools benefiting from some of these ideas uh, that the team actually presented. Uh, likewise for esports. Uh, for Scape, we are doing esports. So, you know, some of the ideas that, that the team came up with, the academy, I think there's a gap. I, uh, the, the team actually rightfully brought up a very good point. Today, we do have uh, Skoga. They actually train uh, uh, youth to become professional. But in terms of event management, in terms of other areas, you know, to have that end-to-end, uh, -end, uh, there is indeed no player in this market that is actually offering that role. So, so this is pretty interesting. Uh, and, and I like the way that the team actually even think of providing possible job opportunities for the youth too, right? Internship, you know, uh, how they could actually recruit interns. And, and from there, they, they can help to carry out the e-bonding e uh, uh, activities. Well done, team. I, I love it, yeah. Thank you, Shirley. And I hope the feeling is uh, mutual on the judges and mentors side as well. So let's go to the third one now, okay? Something which is more closer to our tummies than to our hearts, a small restaurant. And something we might, some of us might be planning to go this evening. So let's try to understand some of the challenges of a small restaurant. Now, Jackson Tan runs a Singapore delicacy. And this restaurant serves local food, uh, but it's in the CBD of Singapore. Now we know that a lot of us are working from home, so you don't get that footfalls and CBD rental is expensive. So what's happening? Before COVID, Jackson Tan's Singapore delicacy was the popular choice, corporate employees, circuit breaker, no dining policy. They moved to takeaway model. They got on the delivery platforms. They adapted, 
uh, they started using a local delivery platform, but low order volume because everybody went to the platform, right? So you have a lot of competition happening there. Um, and they also had to cover revenue to cover their rent as well as staff salary. Dilemma was, should I lease contracts with the landlord, which is gonna get, go up? So what should I do there? Because I need a steady flow of customers. And I also have to ensure that social distancing, uh, which is a new norm. So the challenge is he wants to continue the lease, but he's not sure of sustaining the living. And how can he look at his business model to transform his business? So that's gonna be team eight. Team eight, please share your screens and take it away, please. Go ahead, team eight, share your screen. So thank you judges for giving us the opportunity to present to you. I hope you all had some good lunch because we, we went for chili cap pasta from Singapore delicacies. So I'm Darius along in, and along with my co-host presenter Rachel, we will be presenting case number three. Without further ado, let's begin. In this presentation, we will start by introducing Singapore delicacy, highlighting the key problems faced and then, give, and then we'll give six strategies for the short term and the long term. So Singapore Delicacies is a mid-sized restaurant located in the heart of the CBD. Before COVID-19, the restaurant sources of income included dining in and takeaways. Singapore Delicacy is a mid-end restaurant focusing on fusion food with an average cost of $20. The restaurant has seven employees with pre-COVID revenue of $150,000. The restaurant used to be very popular with people in the CBD. However, Recently, there's been a sharp decline in customers due to lower footfall. This leads us to a key problem, a lack of revenue due to low demand. To solve this, our goals in the short term should be to reduce costs while increasing revenue. In the long term, we can look to strengthen our brand position and also for revenue diversification. To meet our goals, we came up with growth strategies to be implemented immediately in the short term, mid term, and ongoing growth markets, marketing strategies. Our fourth growth strategy falls into the immediate and short term range and aims to decrease costs and increase revenue by achieving economies of scale and increasing delivery efficiency. We plan to do this through a partnership called the We Are One Community Initiative. We notice that other restaurants in the CBD would face similar problems like us like a loss of revenue due to lower demand. This initiative hopes to partner up with other restaurants in the CBD to reduce costs by 10 to 30%, creating a group delivery system, which would increase end profit by 13%, as well as market together. Our first strategy is to achieve economies of scale. A small sized restaurant like Singapore Delicacy is a price taker due to small order volume. Our plan is to collate orders from the, this partnership group, which we'll form, and order in bulk, allowing us to gain bargaining power and leverage on economies of scale. Based on previous cases where this has been done, it has shown to reduce the cost of goods sold by 10 to 30%. Our second strategy is to increase our delivery efficiency and reduce costs. Delivery platforms like Grab have very high commission rates, which are unsustainable for restaurants. Apart from this, a study has shown that 70% of consumers prefer to, prefer to online directly from restaurants. And through the data provided by Essentia, we learn that consumers hope to get a variety of food without paying these high delivery fees. To lower costs, we plan to deliver with our partners and share these delivery costs. Let's go more into detail on this. We plan to deliver via Lala Mo which we found significantly more sustainable than Grab. Whereas Grab charges a 30% fee on all deliveries, Lala Move has a fixed upfront cost, as well as additional costs based on the distance travel and the number of stops. After some calculations, which we have included at the end of this document, we found that bundling several orders at a time on Lala Move and delivering together can significantly cut our costs. 
So why don't I bring you through our new customer journey? Our customers will now online via WhatsApp or Google Forms, which are easy to maintain and run. We would then send these orders to our partner restaurant, and we would then deliver together via Lala Move. Once the customers have eaten, we really hope that they post good reviews about our food and our restaurant. We hope that through this strategy, we can bring a more personalized experience between the restaurant as well as and the customers. Our third strategy are our location-based marketing and discounts. A study by Chop has shown a 39% decrease on spending in the food and beverages industry in during COVID. This has caused more, two main effects. The first being lower marketing marketing costs due to supply and demand. And the second being fewer posts by our competitors. So our idea is to increase our marketing and do location-based marketing and discounts. We plan to we plan to target different regions of Singapore on different days, so that on a particular day we get several orders from a single particular region, and we can deliver to just that region using Lala Move. For marketing, we plan to use a mix of both online as and offline strategies such as Instagram and Facebook, as well as the distribution of flyers. We've shown a concept flyer which we could use. The reason for flyers? Well, they're cheap. 500 flyers cost only $20 to print, and this can be done in bulk. Although online targeted ads are traditionally very expensive, a 90% subsidy by the government for online to offline marketing for the food and beverages industry makes this a very attractive choice along with the fact that there are now fewer competitors. So to give a summary of all this, our first action would be to collate with other restaurants and form a strong partnership. Within this partnership, we will use our buying power to purchase goods at a lower cost. After that, we market together. Our marketing strategy would, in, would target certain areas on certain days. Say, stadium on Mondays, orchard on Tuesdays, we would pair this marketing with discounts on those particular days to ensure high volume orders from those particular regions. Now, since most of our orders are coming from the same region, our delivery costs on Lala Move get decreased. Thus, we are tackling both our short term goals as we decrease costs through deduction of costs of goods sold and the switch to Lala Move, and we're increasing uh, uh, we're sorry we're increasing revenue by increasing total volume sold. Now. Let, let Rachel explain the next part. Thank you, Darius. After utilizing partnerships to reduce costs and increase revenue as immediate and short-term measures, it's important for us to look into mid-term and ongoing strategies to stabilize and diversify our revenue sources. This brings us to our product line expansion in the coming three to six months and also our ongoing branding and marketing strategies. To hack into the new normals, we have to first know what is the new normal. So in our case, this is to understand the new customer behavior on dining experience. Let's rethink about our consumption habits. After circuit breaker, do you still bother to go out and buy stuff? Or would you rather stay at home and wait for the delivery? We are all excited about phrase two, but I'm sure you're also trying to avoid dining in as much as possible. And we all do. According to the research by Nelson, since the COVID-19 outbreak, 50% of the Singaporeans are eating out less two in five of us actually increase our online shopping activities. More importantly, three in four of us say that we will never return to the level of online consumption before COVID, and we are more open to buy packaged food and beverages online. Let's be very honest, we are all comfortable with stay-home consumption. So why only Netflix and chill when you can have chili crab and chill? Singapore Delicacy brings the whole perfect experience to your house with just one click. We offer take-home DIY kits to our customers. For example, for two of our signature dishes, chili crab pasta and fusion lobster lasa. With that, you can be a Michelin chef at home by yourself as well. Moving forward, we'll be selling take-home DIY kits as our sub-products in our restaurant and on e-commerce platforms such as Shopee and Lazada. This will help Singapore delicacy be more accessible in this new normal. With that, we are expecting 4% sales increase in every month. Given that people are getting more comfortable with online consumption during and after the pandemic, 
it is important for us to find out a competitive edge in the online world to make Singapore delicacy visible to everyone with just a few clicks. At the same time, strengthening our brand position is a non-negotiable for us to stand out among our competitors. Starting with our fifth strategy, building and enhancing our online presence would be our very first step. To do this, we'll be leveraging on social media marketing, microsite building, and search engine optimization. To start with, we'll be launching discount campaigns on social media for the first month to encourage direct purchase from our customer in our restaurant. For example, targeted discounts by geographical location and 10% off discounts. So you can see the example of the post that we'll be posting up on our social media platform. Moving forward, social media marketing also help us to raise awareness and generate more sales and leads. According to the white paper research by Chop, special events are shown to increase sales and customer interaction rates on social media sites. As such, we'll be launching monthly awareness campaign to encourage our customer to share memories and reviews to bid for their favorite dish by joining teams with, among with other netizens. As you can see on the screen, stream or lobster, that is the question. All the participants of the winning team with the more responses and posts online will be rewarded a free dish in our restaurant with any purchase that they made in our restaurant. Online presence also includes search engine. First, we'll need to build a site then we'll need to optimize it to make sure that we are visible to our customers. Google is always where you go to find for an answer, and that's the same when you're searching for a restaurant or food delivery. If we, if we want to be visible to our customer, we have to build a microsite that showcases our menu, products, and testimonials. We have, const we have to constantly improve the user interface and update the information as well. Picking reference from one of our potential competitors, we would like to design a clear and simple website layout that showcase all the products that we have and also the testimonial as mentioned previously. After building a microsite, search engine optimization is also a big project for us to work on. With that being said, making sure that our restaurant would appear on the first or second page of the search result is super important. Armed with this goal, we suggest to perform keyword optimization and also link building strategy. For keyword optimization, we will be using geographical, niche, and brand related keywords such as best place to eat near Singapore River, fusion local dishes in Singapore, and Singapore delicacy. To rank high on search result page, the authoritativeness of our site is also important. That brings us to the link building strategy through social sharing. According to Facebook Audience Insights, our target us customer engage most with personal blog like Arbing Foodie and platforms like Trope. Getting mentioned by them would make us more credible in our consumers' eyes. Moreover, the survey from Bread Local stated that more than 80% of the consumers value online review while searching for a local business. So getting customers mentioned and reviewed through our social media campaigns as mentioned previously would be a bonus for us to get higher rank as well. Last but not the least, to stand out from the pool of competition, we have to be unique on what we are selling. In the age of information overload, customers are expecting more than just good food when it comes to restaurant choice. Being able to provide experiential purchase is more satisfying than a material purchase. In Singapore Delicacy, we are selling nostalgic dining experience that triggers consumers' emotions and memories instead of just satisfying their need for food. To achieve this, we'll leverage on online and offline marketing effort in short run and move on to enhance our customer experience such as delivery package and interior design in the long run. And that brings us to the end of the whole proposal that we have prepared. To sum up, we propose partnership with other restaurants and delivery providers for Singapore Delicacy to overcome uncertainties in this pandemic in short run through saving costs and increasing revenue. Afterwards, we hope to diversify our revenue source through product line expansion of DIY Tacon Cake. We also propose branding and marketing as an ongoing strategy to facilitate and support other strategies to drive direct sales. And in Singapore Delicacy, there is where efficiency, satisfactory, and tasty meets. And with all the measures that we put together with the effort of ourselves and the community, we believe that we can all grow stronger after this uncertainty. 
Thank you very much for listening to our presentation. And please feel free to give us any feedback and questions during the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you, Darius and Rachel. Love your backgrounds, very much on brand. Uh, I can see Megan clapping. Uh, <laughs> thanks a lot, guys. And just to let you know that we have been in this for the last, what, one and a half hours, and we are still sustaining interest of our audiences. We have just two dropouts out of 105 people. So just imagine how hooked people are. Uh, and it's not easy to maintain uh, attention spans for one and a half hour for a webinar. I want to bring the uh, judges in. Thanks a lot, Ping Ping, uh, for the mentor. Just saw you, the glimpse of you. You were smiling like a proud parent, uh, <laughs> looking after the Singapore delicacy. So thanks a lot, Ping Ping. Uh, and let's bring in the judges. Also looking at Walter, who is in this domain. <laughs> Do you have any questions? Yes, yes. By the way, uh, before I even ask a question, uh, I just want to say thank you to everyone. Darius, Rachel, was an amazing uh, presentation that you have. As a, uh, as a hotelier and a restaurateur myself, uh, I can totally relate and understand the presentation and great job, guys. Uh, I just have one question because uh, right now, as, as, as shown in the data that you've shared with us, that 51% of the diners of the, of the population actually would still opt to stay at home while the other half are actually uh, keen to actually explore and dine out. So the question is, how do you think we should approach the marketing in terms of keeping a balance between, you know, still addressing the need of both markets? Thank you for your question. So I think that's a very good point to look because it's like half half that people were opt for dining in and also like eating out. So I think in terms of that, uh, as mentioned in our marketing strategy, we have to direct the target, uh, this kind of campaign that we're offering to both audience as well. So at the same time, we're actually encouraging uh, dining in in our restaurant by uh, this kind that we encourage them to have direct purchase in our restaurant. And at the same time for the geographical delivery uh, discount that we are offering, we are encouraging more delivery. So we are able to use this uh, incentive to actually tap on both market to make sure that we'll be able to raise the awareness and at the same time to drive direct sales in two different ways. Yeah, I hope that answer your questions. Yep, that is. That's good. Thank you. Hi guys, I thought this was really cute. Great presentation. Um, I loved the chili crab idea. It was really, really cute. I would love to learn more about how you're going to approach all of the restaurants, the small businesses, and what's required from them to be a part of your group. Thanks for the question, Megan. So see, the fact that most restaurants in the CBD are facing losses at the moment is reason enough for them to want to make a difference and want to see a difference. So we think restaurants would be ready to partner with us, especially on a new initiative like this. I mean, they have almost nothing to lose at the moment. Most of them have really high losses. So we think by simply approaching them, they'll be more than willing to accept a deal with us. I just have one follow-up question. Um, I noted in your strategy that you, you have the idea to pool marketing resources. What would that look like from a business standpoint? What, if, I, if I had a business, what would I uh, have to contribute? Okay, so. Since we're all going to market together, and I'm uh, sorry, since we're all going to market together, we'll have to have one poster with all our uh, details on it, which will go out, right? So basically, we'd want their menu, we want their specialities. We, we wouldn't want the entire like overload of all the items. We just want to put each one's specialities into it. Because as we so said, right, um, shops, I mean, customers want a variety of dishes. So we want a variety of dishes from all these restaurants and avoid repetitions. So let's say if um, company A had fried rice and company B had fried rice, we'd ask them to compensate on one another. So maybe their menus are a bit similar. So we'd ask them to play off each other's strengths and provide you know, their specialities. I hope that answers your question, Megan. It does, thank you so much. Any other questions from the judges? Do remember to fill in your sheets, please. Hey, hi, hi, Darius. Hi, Rachel. I think a uh, wonderful presentation. Huh? I think uh, great that uh, you guys were able to explore uh, different possibilities of uh, what uh, uh, might work for the business. 
I think, uh, you see, the idea of the craft fest, I think I love that. I think um, a simple way to excite uh, consumers, I think that sounds like a brilliant idea. I think the concept of dining experiences, that is also great. I think um, uh, you have various concept restaurants also in Singapore, right? Like, I think we have like dining in the dark. So we have different concept restaurants, some of which could actually work. I think just building on what Megan said, right? I think the VR One Community Initiative, it's an extremely difficult one to pull off. It's an extremely difficult one to pull off. And uh, see, the, the, the piece, right, is that uh, uh, different people would have different vendors from whom they are actually procuring today. Uh, they have different standing arrangements, et cetera, et cetera. So getting everyone together in terms of one common buying pattern, it's an extremely difficult initiative. I think, uh, uh, and I'm just uh, giving you some content, uh, like parallels in the real world in industries as well. I think uh, like many companies come together in order to form industry associations through which we can better deal with uh, various bodies like the government, et cetera, et cetera. But even that takes a lot of effort on part of each of these companies. So it's an extremely difficult proposition. And especially right when you're really trying to fight off and save revenues, I think getting into this kind of uh, arrangement is going to be super difficult and it is possibly very difficult to implement. Yeah? So that's the only uh, one area that I, that I would suggest. I think the, uh, the dining experience and the online presence, I think, of course, is a, is a big one to uh, consider. Yeah? The other piece, right, is that uh, in all these situations, I think uh, always remember that somebody else has also gone through the same situation as you. So, uh, and it's very easy to even benchmark the likes of, say, a Starbucks. Yeah, so, hey, what has Starbucks done during this time in order to ensure that, hey, they still have a steady revenue stream, uh, despite facing the same challenges which any small restaurant actually does, yeah? And implementing some of them could also be quick wins for you. So not every solution needs to be designed from scratch. Uh, there are a lot of benchmarks that you get from other people that you can share and reapply shamelessly steal, uh, because that would also give you some uh, journey forward. And that's the only build that I would have. Uh, especially in this journey forward, yeah. But great presentation, really well done. Thank you, Rishi, and thanks a lot, guys. Thanks, uh, Darius and Rachel, and thanks, Ping Ping, uh, for shaping this study well, and uh, can really see some of the brand as well as some of the inputs being applied. Just to let you guys know, we have Restaurant Association of Singapore in our audience, and we will be sharing this case study to them, uh, with them, uh, uh, up, upon your consent so that they can share it back with all the restaurants in Singapore. So just imagine the amount of impact your work would have. Thank you so much. Uh, this is great to hear. Thanks all judges and especially thanks to Ping Ping for guiding us through this journey. Awesome. All right. So last one hour, let's go chop chop. Let's get into education and training. And that's our second last uh, case study team 11, just be prepared for presenting your screen. Uh, let's talk about this case study. This is about education and training. And this is about Daniel Chung, who is the founder of a first aid training center. A uh, different sort of a training wherein you are looking at how can you be more hands-on. And this sort of training is hard to do virtual, you know, because it's first aid, you need a person to be around. So all the classes had to be closed to code because of social distancing measures. And thinking of switching into online model, uh, Daniel had concerns. Uh, he wanted to understand that how do I ensure that students stay attentive during the class? Theoretical knowledge versus actual practice. Theoretical knowledge, there's a lot out there in how-to videos, but what about the actual practice? Certifications, how do I ensure that the students are not searching for answers online as they do exams? And I'm sure a lot of education and training institute have that problem. And even if you have plagiarism checkers out there, they are not the best. Another concern was about the lack of sale for online classes as interested participants may not want to take up online classes. So the challenge was, how do I craft a temporary marketing strategy for the training center and sustain my business for the few months uh, until social distancing is no more applicable? And then how do I make things go online? So let's go to team 11 and guys share your screen and take it away. Hey, good afternoon, judges, mentors, and friends. I represent Team 11 in today's finals. Judge Vernia, you're looking for a new perspective of what the new normal would look like. 
Today, we will demonstrate the use of real-time social data from Icentia to back up our simple yet strategic, creative and implementable solution to a problem that a Singaporean first aid business faces today. Daniel is a trained SCDF emergency paramedic and represents our client today, Help Aid Ready. Help Aid Ready was founded in 2006, offering a comprehensive range of emergency response training and certification classes. His company is the fourth largest player in Singapore with a relative market share of 12%. But wait, let's pause. Everyone, what is the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of a first aid training course? That you need to be present at a training location physically and usually it takes up a full day or two and then you have to travel to pass the final test again. So Judge Walter, you know all about making customer experience as seamless and convenient as possible. We feel the same way and we plan to bring first aid courses online to minimize the hassle while retaining the integrity of the first aid training. Team 11 has identified three pain points in bringing classes online. First, we will need to ensure that they stay attentive during the class because they could be easily distracted from things happening at home. And second, to ensure students are doing their steps correctly as theoretical knowledge could be different from actual practice. Thirdly, to ensure students are not searching for answers online when, when attempting the exams. So let's look at the Singapore market for first aid training to see if anyone has attempted to do an online model. This overview of the market landscape shows that there's only one other player offering online courses and that course is merely designed with MOM's guidelines. This is awesome news for us because Help It Ready can be the first course to on offer online certification. And what other pain points do you notice here? The steep $300 course enrollment fees? We are missing a prime market here, which is students below the age of 25 who are not Skills Future Fund eligible. Well, the good news is that with an online model, we can drive the course fees down, increase enrollment, and better cater to people's time needs. So our client's first aid business has always been very traditional, like the rest of the market players. But we are empowering him to create a new normal. We studied insights from Icentia, and the data suggests that people are very tired of whole-day courses. So we created a simple set of eight online efficient, self-contained modules. The total time to complete this course takes less than half the time of traditional courses, 6 hours versus 14 hours. So now, anyone can study at any time and anywhere. And there will be trainers and games to reinforce the learning until students are confident enough to take the practical test with a high pass rate. The biggest pain point of learning from home is the attention span, especially when the content is dry. Insights from Icentia suggest that sentiments such as forgot or boring or Feeling Xian are the main reasons for the low interest in online courses. Our solution will use pre-recorded 360 videos shot from different angles to simulate attendance at a physical class at a low cost. So for example, a student can pick between a wide angle and close up angle to visually understand what the trainer is teaching. For example, chest compression or airway blockage. Now the training quality is help its utmost priority. Our survey shows that 84% of people wouldn't dare to execute CPR, despite their certification status. So what our module offers is the opportunity to make mistakes now and gain the confidence that they need. One of the modules is a Bandersnatch Choose Your Adventure simulation. For example, choosing the steps to treat a cut or burn or fall wound. And if they are wrong, the system will notify the trainer to follow up with these students individually. And this personalized experience is key to ensure our client's online course quality. And our lessons aren't lectures or tutorials. That's so boring. We'll use static VR as the medium for delivery. Simply host the video content online and you don't need any specialized coding or you don't need an expensive headset. We keep students engaged organically instead of forcing them to pay attention. So to ensure that students are progressing optimally through the eight sessions, we give them points for answering mini quizzes and for games that they score well in. And the eight modules allow them to pace themselves and fit their own learning cadences. So engagement in VR also fits social distancing measures that businesses have to abide by. And people are still able to learn first aid from the comforts of their own home. Adding on engagement effects, the adoption of choose your own adventure, allowing users to understand the negative repercussions of wrong decisions made during first aid processes and allow them to immerse themselves further into practicing first aid. So this automation doesn't mean that our trainers are unnecessary, right? Especially in the pandemic induced recession, we need to protect our staff's interests. 
And with this new model, we have created an efficacious allocation of resources. There will be no more time wasted spending packing logistics, traveling to each physical training location or taxi fees. They can even work from home. Trainers can now spend more time engaging with students who need personalized help. And our model empowers these coaches to invest their time optimally. Finally, there's an oral and practical test at the end of the eight sessions. So Judge Vichy, your niche is high performance and complex challenges. How do we prevent students from Googling answers in the oral test? Now, browser lockdown APIs are easy to implement. Video detection algorithms such as Gecko can sense shifty eyes and record the time taken to ensure integrity during exams. And only after passing this online test, students will then be able to book their practical test dates. A low-cost scheduling API will help in crowd control at the final testing stations, and this automatically locks the safe entry visits for contact tracing. This gives the students flexibility and control of their schedule with 14 days to take the practical exam for certification. So where will we exactly host this online course? So we propose two phases, a short-term and long-term digital transformation phase. In the next three months, our client will pilot the program on a class hosting site, such as Coursera or Udemy, which provide discussion channels for students and an easy interface to review content with trainers. The cloud solution customer management for trainer and staff will also benefit. At the end of quarter three 2020, should the buy-in rate increase, Daniel can then invest long-term in developing his own platform optimized to his business needs. So Judge Megan, you have judged multiple hackathons before. You know that marketing is the right audience. Marketing to the right audience is just as important as operational strategy. So let's take a look at exactly who will be joining our clients online course. We found that the target demographic is students and corporate workers, just like you and I, who have been spending more time based at home and taking the time now to upskill ourselves through online courses. So Icentia's indexing capabilities and sentiment valuation have informed our marketing strategy to revolve around four key pillars, being purpose-driven, visual content, appealing to the need for social activity, and employing an emotional and heartwarming narrative. So Icentia has revealed that Singaporeans are more likely to sign up with courses with their friends. And another very important factor is audience affinity. Which type of audience is likely to lean towards self-funded first aid training? So we propose targeting people who are already participants in the act of giving, such as volunteers in animal shelters, soup kitchens, and, kitchen, and charities. We partner with VWOs to identify potential leads who are not yet first aid certified, but have the interest to. Our affordable course fees also allow us to target students from JCs, polys, ITs, and universities, and they previously would not have been able to afford those course fees. We can also work with government organizations such as SkillsFuture to feature us on their broadcast list as being a way to upskill while staying safe in this pandemic. So now, even our client company has its own corporate social responsibility to fulfill. We propose a branding campaign at the intersection of our target demographic and beneficiaries. In this case, migrant workers in the building and construction industry, which is a high-risk accident workplace. So for every three course signups, Help It Ready will sponsor one certification course to migrant workers who cannot afford their training fees. And Daniel's courses are also available in Bengali and Tagalog to cater to their needs. Isentia also revealed that we can leverage on existing students to widen our lead generation funnel with just their current behavior on social media. So emotional storytelling and heartwarming content will motivate retweet and sharing of content just like you and I do on social media. We propose a simple affiliate program. So Daniel will set up a photo booth at the certification venue and encourage students to record, share, and spread positive reviews of their experience within their micro social networks, along with their affiliate link. And each attributed sign up will then earn them credit for future refresher courses after the two years where your license expires, and thus increasing the customer lifetime value of Daniel's clients. We also like to open up donation drives to further Daniel's impact in equipping Singapore in equipping Singapore with first aid ready skills by offering free courses to target audiences who can't afford it. And this will tap on Singaporeans' generosity from their solidarity budgets. So hey judges, how would you find an online course? 
Did you know that 92% of people get their information about first aid courses through search engines? So Icentia has identified 42 target keywords and phrases that allows Help Aid Ready to be on the first page of search results, on rank zero, to be the first website that visitors click on. The media content, our affiliate program, would further boost our SERP rankings. Finally, piecing together the operational and marketing solutions, this timeline showcases the student journey from online impression to enrollment, then learning and attaining the certificate for completion. Our marketing strategy aims for practical success with a fiscally responsible accounting. It is very important that this plays a role when it comes to solutions for small SMEs. Our marketing efforts are expected to make 250 impressions on social media, with an average of five to six touch points per user. Our marketing sizing and conversion rate foresees a modest estimate of at least 3,200 certifications in the next quarter, which addresses Daniel's pain point on sales. With such extensive measures, we promise a 40% retention in the lead base who finished their first certification, hence extending the lifetime value of our customers. Here are our revenue projections for the next quarter. It is clearly viable, profitable, and a scalable revenue stream. Here is a comprehensive preliminary budgeting done to fund the initial digital transformation. The budget is feasible as our client has a three-year lead revenue in the corporate account. My digital marketing teammate, Kok Chang, will be happy to take more questions on this afterwards. So, Judge Vivek, you were looking for a simple solution that is easy for consumers to convert to, affordable for Daniel to execute, and customized to the new normal. Help It Ready's online curriculum and 30-minute practical tests will prove resilient in any circuit breaker, phase one, two, or three. Our eight-session online course is comprehensible for all aptitude levels. Icentia and our own survey has been the data foundation for Help Aid Ready's online training course, operational and marketing strategy. We've used valuable real-time consumer insights to develop a curriculum that works for our students. In facing digital transformation, automation will assist Help Aid Ready in defending its business and its human resources. In fact, staff empowerment here is key as trainers no longer need to waste time on administrative work. We will be the first self-contained hybrid first aid certification provider, providing a seamless experience for online learning that is efficacious for first aid training. And Help Aid will use interactive video hosting capabilities to engage and monitor each student's learning progress, personalizing the student's journey and improving first-time pass rates. Help It Ready will engage students like no online learning course has ever done before. And so, Help It Ready can pioneer the new normal for online first aid training, and we are ready to implement this together. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ashley and Team 11, and a special mention to Ed, the mentor. Uh, really good job, guys, but you're quite sneaky as well. I can see that you were mentioning the judge's name and getting the attention span. You know, as the judge's attention seems to wane, you start saying, hey, Judge Vishy, and Vishy is hooked on. So good job there, and great job in using insights. So over to the judges for questions. Yeah, hi, uh, good work team. Uh, this is um, yeah, a very interesting way of picking up a topic, which often we will not consider as, um, yeah. as a first course that comes to your mind when you want to do an online class, which is on first date. Uh, so this is great work, very creative solutions. Uh, and you have, you have worked out the implementation plan to the end, which is, um, it looks like it's a pretty robust approach that you would want to take for this. I just wanted to understand some fundamentals of this. Maybe I missed it uh, because there was quite a bit of content in, um, this, in your case. Uh, who's the customer here? Who's, who's that one person who will raise his hand and say, I want to take first aid uh, training? Yeah. So we are targeting students and corporate workers who they need, for example, if they have uh, requirements from their workplace to have a basic CPR certificate, or they need to learn how to use AED, especially when they are working in um, high-risk environments. So this course will come in at a very low and affordable price point. Yeah, and so especially because people are now trying to um, get to upskill themselves in this pandemic, and if the the traditional, um, you know, and you're not just trying to do a course where you feel like oh you should do it, but if this is a genuine 
genuinely helpful life skill, then they can also do this online. They don't have to wait until um, like physical, the physical locations open and then they do the certification. So it really is trying to make the best use of their time and our clients' time. Understood. And your strategy is there to increase the now the segment on which earlier the first stage training was targeting. So are you are you just bringing them back because they are not able to be physically present in the place, or are you just adding on new segment of consumers? So we are planning to have an entirely new segment of consumers. So previously the course fees are really expensive, and only adults who are age twenty five and above have access to Skills Future funding. So now that we can target um, students from tertiary institutions and we can target volunteers who don't have um, sufficient skills funding, they can easily channel um, the $60 that goes to this course and they can get certified. And yeah, so it opens up a whole new market. And how do you intend to um, incentivize people who take a course? Because usual courses are for self-improvement. I'll, I'll learn a course on digital marketing. I would, I would learn a course on Python coding and so on. But that's a self-improvement. I'd possibly proceed uh, in my career ahead. Something like first aid. How do you incentivize people to come up and say, okay, I think I want to sign up? So especially with, especially with the coming pandemic, we have realized that people need to be um, be able to respond to emergencies when they are at home as over 400,000 of cardiac arrest um, emergencies happen in out of hospital settings and you know and we would we will try to push the narrative that CPR can increase the survival rate of the person who's undergo who has who is um being um, in, who is in cardiac arrest condition can increase their survival rate by two or three times if they are rendered CPR immediately so that and we are targeting people who already have the heart to give and who are already in volunteering networks, such as um, soup kitchens and people who work in animal shelters. So they are more likely to buy into this program first. And following, the, to get them to reach out to their own social circles, then we will, that's when our affiliate model comes in to, uh, so that they can spread the word. Yeah. Understood. Thank you, Any further questions from the judges? Yeah, so just one from my end, I think, uh, hey, uh, like there was a slide in terms of the options between say, uh, hosting yourself in a platform like Coursera versus like having an independent one. Uh, what I couldn't sense was the conclusion in that, yeah, in terms of like, what is it that you actually are thinking as the way forward and the pros and cons of each approach, I think, of course, you have laid out. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to sense check which direction do you want to proceed in? So the direction is for the Coursera and Udemy to be our hosting website for the pilot tr trial because mm -hmm. we recognize that our whole website development will be very costly for a small SME. So we will use um, Coursera as they already have fully developed communication capabilities, customer like solution management for the staff to work with each of their students. And if the buy-in rate is good and we have and we meet the profitability status, and then Daniel in the long term can shift entirely to his own web platform where he can customize like the V the, the VR um, CPR video so you can really simulate being in a physical first aid class. Got it, yeah, got it. No, I think, uh, see, uh, see, that is a important one. And, and I, I think I probably didn't just hear it being verbalized. Yeah, meaning that, um, see, with this, apart from awareness, right, I think it becomes no longer a Singapore only solution. Yeah. I think uh, with the likes of Coursera, Udemy, it becomes a global solution. <coughs> Hence the possibility in terms of the number of people that you can actually get expands significantly beyond what what is actually there. Yeah. So even uh, looking at uh, the platform itself in terms of what kind of solution exists for first aid courses there, etc. It's a great way, according to me, to uh, uh, to go there and that actually makes real sense. Yeah. The other piece, right, is that even from an online uh, learning module perspective, one of the most important things that everybody would emphasize is to have bite-sized content. Meaning, uh, the more the content actually strays beyond like five to six minutes, that is when actually people start uh, dropping off, et cetera, et cetera. 
so even as you frame everything, I think uh, do ensure that uh, you have bite-sized content and that is the way that you actually ensure that uh, you continue to engage people through the course of your modules. Yeah? So that's generally the learning that you'll even see in the likes of Coursera. Uh, that majority. So I think uh, you make a really good point and that's what we're trying to bring across that the the current model is too, it doesn't capture the attention span, doesn't reinforce like lifelong learning of the skills. That's why people still feel that they, they don't feel empowered to actually carry out CPR when they need to. So with this online module, you can always audit the course again and again and you can practice and each session is actually like um, only 80 minutes long and it comes with a lot of interactive content. So it's really very immersive and trying to capture their attention. Yeah. Yeah. But great work done. Yeah, great work done, Ashley. Thank you so much. Any last questions from James Bernier Walter? Yeah, uh, I just have one question, you know, because, uh, you know, first aid, uh, the first perception for, for many people, it is something that is often organized by organizations, by companies. So how do we make it more like a grassroots level kind of approach in terms of, if you, you mentioned earlier that you want to approach like tertiary students, uh, how, how do you plan to do that, to make it more engaging for common people? So especially with the online model that we are promoting, we want to create channels where they can sign up together. So I think one of the big pain points that um, Isentia highlighted is that online learning tends to feel very lonely, especially when you are socially isolating. So we are trying to um, allow them, the students, to create groups where they can um, a chat with people who are doing the same, auditing the same session as them, or they can even make new friends in like the new class. So it really, um, so that we can encourage more group signups. And especially with the, um, with the CSR initiative, when we publicize this um, CSR initiative to the schools and the different government organizations, and they can see that, okay, we are coming from a social enterprise point of view where we are matching, um, the, where we are matching the donation of courses to migrant workers. So it can really be their part in doing, in doing something together for, to make Singapore more first aid ready. Okay. I think, I think to add on, so sorry, um, I just want to add on one point. Uh, I think one of the main things uh, you have brought up is very, uh, is, is very true, is that people have to kind of participate in this together. And how we want to reach out to even more communities is that when probably when we gain enough traction for Daniel in the third quarter or the fourth quarter of this year, what we can actually do is even start new things like the sales bundle or even make a uh, more emphasis on the affiliate program. That will actually increase more reach to other people. And that's where people feel that they are part of this entire new community that all doing first aid together. And that's where you, you start to see that kind of social bond for yourself and you can see you being part of a bigger purpose. Thanks. James, you had a question? Yeah, I was just going to ask you a really quick one. So when you're looking at like the vast volumes of social media data that you guys have and, um, and representing data, I'm always interested to know what, what was the what was the one insight that jumps out at you as, as the key insight across all of the metrics that you looked at? What's what's the one that really jumps out at you and you think that the audience should should remember and why? I think the key insight for me was that even with traditional certification, that 84% of people still don't feel empowered to there to practice CPR when the situation comes for it because that there really exists a problem with the current model that if you're doing a crash course for two days you won't remember like what is the exact way to do it so with this online course you know they we allow you to always go back in and audit the course and refresh your memory with all the the interactive content so it really feels that you are empowered to truly be able to practice your CPR and not just get a certification for the sake of it Sorry, can I also add on one point? I think for me personally, because all of us were doing the data together, um, for me personally, what I feel is the main key insight is when um, like all, all of us actually, we all want to do meaningful stuff. They have a lot of search uh, results about meaningful and even places where I can donate my money meaningfully too. And these two channels, none of them actually lead towards first aid. And that was the most interesting part about me, uh, about this entire process, because we realized that, hey, how come everyone wants to think about meaningful stuff? Like, you know what, you want to donate to cat shelters, you want to donate to migrant workers, you want to donate to a lot of people. But however, no one actually thought about, hey, how about you um, helping people and equipping people with such important essential skills? 
Thank you and great job guys, well done. Thanks team and thanks again Ed for helping with your mentorship because this was amazing. Time to dress up guys, last one and half an hour to go. We will also have some judges Q&A. So now is the time for you to start asking questions in the Q&A section in, the, uh, in your Zoom bar. And Sabrina, we can also launch the poll as the team speaks. All right, so fashion, lifestyle, and uh, detail. So the case study is about Jenny, and Jenny is running her own a small boutique shop in Boonle Plaza. Uh, her clothes are purchased from bulk from Taobao uh, shops online. And because of COVID, uh, her retail shop was closed. Now, the challenge uh, for Jenny was all about that, how do I craft a customized marketing strategy to set up her presence online and a strategy that would be a good choice in the current circumstances, given that Jenny is not tech savvy, she doesn't know any models or photographers, and she has reservations about the, the competitiveness of the product itself. All right, so let's go team 13. Can you start sharing your screen, please? Okay. okay, good afternoon, judges. Thank you for joining us today. We are Jiawen and Jiayi, and on behalf of our team, we'll be presenting our marketing strategy for Jenny. So here's a brief summary of what we'll be covering today. First, we'll start with the background. Then we'll be moving on to Jenny's unique selling proposition, growth in e-commerce, omnichannel, op, omnichannel strategy, our goals, marketing strategy, and lastly, the overall timeline and budget. COVID-19 has resulted in many small retail stores like Jenny to close, and social distancing measures have caused businesses to be severely affected due to the lack of traffic to drive sales. As seen from the graph, a typical day in the past can drive up a footfall of an average of 100 customers, but during the pandemic, we see a drastic fall of 63% and possibly even more. For a start, we'll do a SWOT analysis. Some of her strengths consist of her established social networks with Taobao suppliers, and her knowledge and ability to pick up quality clothes. However, some of her weaknesses include her lack of digital presence and USP. The opportunities that we identified include digitalizing her business, the government grants provided to support businesses, and increasing manpower support through working with interns, for she faces a threat of the saturated online retail market. As a result, it is important for Jenny to position herself as a focused differentiator, where she seeks to create a higher value than competitors, by offering products or services with unique features. This is because many big players are competing on prices, making it difficult for Jenny to be a price leader as she has insufficient economies of scale to compete. As such, we propose for Jenny to spread her passion for fashion through a unique brand story. Jenny believes in making ladies feel good regardless of their skin tone with affordable quality clothes that represent themselves. As the tagline goes, Jenny wants her customer to look good, to feel good. Using Jenny's fashion expertise, we'll be selling trendy clothes for females aged between 18 to 35. So why this particular target audience? They are a group of digital natives, as shown from how they form the bulk of online shoppers in Singapore, and at least half of them shop online several times a month. They also have a preference for convenience. But we understand the uncertainty with regard to online sales and consumers' behavior during the pandemic, we see it as an opportunity for Jenny's business to grow through e-commerce. E-commerce refers to the buying or selling of products over the internet, and it is the fastest growing segment in the digital sector, with an expected revenue of $7 billion in 2025. So as you can see, here are the top three e-commerce platforms. Furthermore, there is an, at least a 30% increase in online purchases on fashion-related products. So with the rise of the home body economy, where most consumers continue to stay at home, despite the leave of stay home restrictions, shopping online will still be a norm. Customers continue to shop online mainly because they get to enjoy cost savings and it is convenient with 24 seven shopping. Hence, we strongly recommend for Jenny to utilize an omni-channel strategy, which is a combination of e-commerce platform and physical shop, as it is the most practical and low cost solution requiring the least upskilling and knowledge acquisition. So having an additional digital platform alongside Jenny's physical store will bring about improved customer satisfaction, perceived quality, perceived value, and loyalty. 
So this is also in alignment to the government's plan to pilot a smart commerce ecosystem that blends both digital and physical retail. Still not convinced? Here we highlight two success stories from Charles and Keith and Popo, where they first started out as small physical stores and they have eventually expanded their businesses online. They are now currently successful on both channels. So now we will walk you through a new customer purchase journey based on our recommended omnichannel strategy. And this is substantiated by Icentia data. So with Jenny's new digital presence, customers can now search for her products via a quick Google search term in phase one and find out more about them via online reviews in phase two. An engagement phase next will help to connect customers' questions to Jenny directly before they proceed to make an online purchase. So due to the omnichannel strategy, customers can now decide to purchase online or physically in stores. If they purchase online, they will receive their products through delivery. Lastly, customers will then be able to enjoy post-purchase customer service and rewards program. This increases our overall customer satisfaction and retention. So we have set the following goals for Jenny. For the first three months, we'll be creating various accounts for Jenny across different online platforms and building up her customer database with her unique, with her unique selling proposition of high quality products and good customer service. We aim to achieve a $7,000 in online sales revenue and gain a minimum of 500 followers on Instagram. Based on our calculations, the predicted e-commerce sales revenue for Jenny is $26,700. So over the next one year, we will be building up Jenny's reputation and aiming to achieve $28,000 online sales revenue and gain 5,000 followers on Instagram minimally. We will be presenting our marketing strategy according to the sales funnel. Awareness requires getting the word out about Jenny's shop through the internet and social media, while consideration refers to the steady stream of content produced to publicize Jenny's brand. Decision is when the customers consider if they want to purchase her products either online or offline while action targets repeated customers. So altogether, these four strategies combined will allow us to achieve the goal of increasing reach and driving sales through both online and, and offline platforms. And we will first be creating a digital presence on Lazada, which is the top e-commerce platform in Singapore, with a monthly visitor count of 7.8 million as compared to Q10 and Shopee. We can thus leverage on Lazada's customer base to clear existing stops and increase sales. Jenny also qualifies for the e-commerce booster package launched by Enterprise Singapore, hence receiving up to 90% support on the first $10,000 spent on digitalizing her business. And to boost product visibility and grow sales on Lazada, Jenny can make use of search engine optimization, SEO, and search engine marketing, SEM. For SEO, we can identify the top 10 to 15 related keywords through the Lazada search engine and optimize these keywords in Jenny's product titles to increase her search ranking organically. For SEM, under Lazada's um, e-commerce booster package, there will be sponsored search to promote Jenny's products on the Lazada search page, where Jenny only pays when her product advertisement is clicked. We will also be setting up a Shopify website which is not only user-friendly for Jenny, who is not as tech-savvy, but also allows Jenny to have full control over brand experience and identity. Her intern support will come in handy here in the creation of the website. And Shopify also enables Jenny to digitalize her stock management system, tracking her physical and online inventory and updating it in real time on the website. Furthermore, under the Start Digital program offered by OCBC, Jenny can make use of a one-year free subscription to Shopify. Under her website, she will be able to utilize a reward system to boost awareness and customer retention. So new customers can subscribe via email and mobile to receive a promo code of 10% off their first online purchase. New custom, um, they also can refer friends to earn a $5 voucher and accumulate points in the long run, which can be used for future purchases. And the collection of customers data for direct marketing enhances the potential of repeat customers for Jenny. To further encourage loyal customers from Jenny's physical retail store to move online as well, walk-in customers who subscribe via email will also receive a 10% off in-store in addition to the 10% of their first online purchase. Next, we will be creating a Google My Business account, which allows for increased awareness and credibility of Jenny's products. So 82% actually read online reviews for local businesses, and with photos uploaded, listings also receive 35% more click-throughs. 
As a significant proportion, which is 33% of our primary target audience uses Instagram, we will also be creating an Instagram business account to increase outreach. 70% of users search for brands on Instagram. Having a business profile allows for automated targeting based on online activity of users and also to filter by location, demographics and interests. Instagram is also a one-stop platform as users can easily click into Jenny's profile or swipe up on the story to enter her website directly. So Instagram also has the second highest average order value, which refers to the expenditure of items on Instagram. Lastly, there is a high user interaction rate, which allows Jenny to interact with her customers. Statistics have shown that influencer marketing and video content uh, increases revenue. Hence, to ensure a steady stream of content on our various online platforms, we will be reaching out to micro-influencers, who are people with 1,000 to 100,000 followers on Instagram, to provide them with the opportunity for free photo shoot sessions that will allow for mutual advertising. So this is because micro-influencers will get to increase their exposure, while Jenny is able to tap on their existing followers for publicity. We will be tapping on Jenny's fashion expertise to launch monthly lookbook ideas, which is a collection of videos and photographs to showcase a brand's clothing, hence building up her brand differentiation by creating a unique style. A theme will be decided based on social media data to gather the fashion trends. For example, current trends include Korean style clothing and work from home fashion based on Icentia data. Given that lookbooks are the most necessary content for engagement on fashion platforms and posts with relevant hashtags receive up to 70% higher engagement rate, we believe that they will be good for Jenny to have. So here is a mock-up done by our content Buzzing, buzzing, and we're humming, humming, and we're loving, loving yeah. all day. Yeah, so in addition to Instagram advertisements and monthly lookbook ideas, we will also be promoting through IGTV and Instagram Live, giving a more personal touch to the brand. So this will be done in collaboration with micro-influencers as well, where live tryout sessions and Q&A will take place with potential buyers, for example, for them to find out more about sightings available. A special promotion code will also be released during this live stream, which is only valid for two hours to create a sense of urgency. The collaboration will be extended to other local retail brands such as Curry K, which sells artisan crafted accessories, and Closet Children, which sells reusable face masks, where new collections will either be sold in a bundle or given to lucky winners in a giveaway. In the giveaway, the winner has to take photos of the items won and share it on their social media, boosting publicity. We will also be providing a personalized shopping experience through a mystery bag service by using customers' measurements to handpick a complete outfit. As Jenny is able to provide personalized customer service and fashion expertise, this enhances the surprise and unique element for her customers and further differentiates Jenny from other shops. With data such as sizing and design preferences, Jenny can use it to advertise related products and convert them into repeat customers, and this will generate sustainable revenue for her. In the long term, to leverage on Jenny's fashion knowledge and expertise, Jenny can collaborate with local seamstresses to customize mass mass bought clothes. The limited edition collection will bring a twist to the clothes and set Jenny apart from normal retailers. So this collaboration will be seasonal. For example, the MRT team dress in lieu of National Day. Moreover, Jenny's fashion expertise can be further explored through the trend of upcycling and reinventing past season clothes. These pieces of clothing are limited and at the same time promote sustainability. It is also a good method for Jenny to clear stocks that are out of trend. So to sum up, here's a brief timeline of the entire strategy. Jenny's physical store in Bunling Plaza will remain operational throughout the year, alongside her loyalty program and good customer service. In the initial awareness stage of the first month, we will be creating her digital presence on Lazada, Instagram, Google My Business and Shopify. In the next three months, we will also be working on SEO and SEM on Lazada, Instagram advertising, preparing photos and videos for Instagram, Lazada, and Shopify. After which, Jenny will go on to post a monthly lookbook content on Instagram from August and conduct IGTV and IG Live sessions from October in the consideration stage. 
from December onwards, Jenny will be collaborating with local retailers and conducting giveaways, creating a personalized shopping experience for her customers a month later as well. In the long term, collaboration with local seamstresses and upcycling will take place. Our estimated budget breakdown is as follows. Jenny's monthly rental is $8,000 with manpower cost of $2,740. Consisting of Jenny's monthly salary of $2,500 and intern pay of $240 after a 70% government subsidy. Jenny's marketing budget is $2,000 from an estimated 10% of her monthly revenue of $20,000. And the Lazada e-commerce package costs $1,000 after a 90% government subsidy. So the estimated cost of goods is $6,000 with our goods sold at 60% markup. With the marketing budget of $2,000, we can reach out to 1,418 customers given that the cost per click is $1.41. So with that, we have come to the end of our presentation. Our team at Fashionista Consulting consists of a group of capable and reliable specialists who have expertise in their respective fields. Technology is limitless and what we shared today is just a small part of what we can do. Instagram filters and WhatsApp stickers are further ideas which we can venture into as well since they are low cost, viral and unique. We will be glad to respond to any questions that you may have. And thank you for your attention and we would also like to extend our appreciation to our boss Suzanne for her guidance. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Team 13. And uh, I could see Suzanne smiling, smiling all along. And in case you guys are wondering and reporting them that they're breaking the social distancing rules, uh, they are sisters living in the same household, guys. Okay. <laughs> so in case there was some nasty bits going on, here we shoot the myths. All right. So let's do a quick five minutes of Q&A and then uh, we'll just go around the table in terms of your overall experience, judges and mentors. So over to judges. Hi, yeah, this is Verdia here. Um, I think it was a really great um, presentation. I like that, you know, it was a really sound strategy and you really thought about each of the different um, digital offline uh, and online channels that you can utilize to your advantage. Um, I just have two questions. And the first one is really about your target audience where you segmented the 15 year olds to the 34 year olds. Um, and the fact that, you know, these are very, it's a very large uh, audience age gap. Uh, and I was just thinking, are you going to customize or tailor any of your content or targeted uh, strategies to really uh, narrow down to this group? Uh, thank you for your feedback and also the question that you have asked. So basically, you are focusing on the fact that the fact uh, there is a huge age range from 18 to 35. Is that uh, to clarify your question? So how do we focus it better, is it? Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, so right now, um, we have a lot of ideas that um, I think it spans across because like, uh, as we show all the different online platforms, on Instagram, we actually identified that a lot of them are mostly the younger group of like audience that we are targeting right here. So I would see it to be around maybe 18 to the mid 20s or maybe some of them are also 30s. There are also, I think Instagram has been increasing popularity and all that. Yeah, so that's definitely one platform they are hoping to ta target the younger audience. But for the slightly older ones, I think a platform that we have mentioned constantly is about Lazada. So Lazada is actually a very popular um, e-commerce platform that I think doesn't restrict any age range in fact. And I think it covers a lot. They sell a lot of other products ranging from not just clothing wise, they also sell a lot of other products that will definitely attract the attention of those who are in the older group of, uh, I mean, those who are looking for home styling, you know, those kind of different items. So definitely they will also be on that platform itself. So that would be an age group that we will also uh, be targeting in that, in that range, yeah. Mm. yeah. Okay, then, um, then my other question is, who exactly do you think are Jenny's direct competitors? Direct competitors? Mm, so right now, because technically she's only having a physical shop front in the Boon Lay Plaza, so definitely it's all those um, physical stores that you see with no online presence at all. Yeah, so that would be the, uh, our current competitor. But we are hoping, because we are trying to shift her to an online platform, so that's why we pit ourselves against like bigger, brand, bigger brands such as like Charles and Key, Purple, is because we want to show her that, you know, like sometimes you need to like dream big, you know, that kind of thing, so that like there is a certain form of like motivation for her to like know that this is something that she can work towards too as well. Yeah. Mm. Okay, thank you. Last question. Thank you.
looks like no more questions from the judges. Okay, I think uh, uh, let me ask you. Yeah. See, see, uh, see, one of the points, sir. Uh, first of all, Jay, Javin, I think uh, really well done. I think uh, it's a scenario that is playing out uh, very often, right, in Singapore as well. I think multiple businesses actually getting impacted and so on. Now, the, the part that I didn't fully really understand, right, I think you said that we will design, we will design this, uh, etc. But we know that Jenny is not tech savvy. Yeah, and yes. uh, in that context, who is actually going to do the design and who uh, ensures that uh, uh, you can really implement some of these things? Yeah? Because, see, one of the principles that we always follow in business as well is to play to your own strengths. Uh, mm -hmm. and understanding what's your strength and, and what's an area that you don't understand as well. Uh, so how will you ensure that through the course of this process, uh, Jenny feels comfortable and you actually take her along in the process? Because it's a human element that we often do not recognize enough uh, during business, uh, but that comes back to be one of the most important factors to also consider. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so actually um, we are engaging help of interns um, we are thinking of polytechnic interns or university interns with the expertise of like visual design and communications to actually help Jenny out with the technical aspect. Because Jenny herself has fashion expertise and knowledge, she just might not be able to like um, be able to create like a monthly lookbook ideas or like mm -hmm. film the videos that to mm -hmm. put on Instagram. But she can actually design like oh how would the model looks like and how the mm -hmm. how to design um the clothes of like how to style the micro influencers for like this monthly lookbook ideas for example. Yeah, mm -hmm. so we also have um are planning to have the intern um, design, help her in the creation of the website as well. Because we understand that even if the website is uh, user-friendly, she might not be able to help um, be able to design a nice website that will attract her potential customers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And also as part of the uh, Lazada e-commerce package as well, there is also uh, free online courses for Jenny to be able to attend so that she can actually... Um, sorry, let me just go through... Yeah, so there are actually like advanced training classes for her. So as part of this like e-commerce starter package, this actually like offered like online um courses on how to like use Lazada and how to um learn about the marketing techniques. So in this way, in the first three months, she actually gets to like learn about like oh SEO, SEM, mm -hmm. and how like and she'll be able to like uh go through like step by step um what is going on so that she doesn't feel overwhelmed and lost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, so great. I yeah. think uh, this is a great piece. I think uh, just one more thing. Uh, for you to consider, right? Especially in the e-commerce space, I think logistics is also a super mm. critical element. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Being, being able to service to the end consumer, mm. etc., becomes super critical. Mm. I think that's a factor also to consider as you plan for things. Huh? I think yeah. uh, because it's going to be a new area of uh, that Denny uh, needs to learn on. Uh, mm. But I think really well done. Huh? I think it looks nice, looks comprehensive. Uh, I particularly liked how your uh, entire. Uh, uh, cost per acquisition was 1.4. I think uh, that was really nice. I think that you had modeled all of it with 1,418 people that you would actually reach. I think it's really commendable. I think uh, uh, like putting the maths behind it, I think that's really nice. Yeah, so really well done. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Team 13. And now we get into the judging bit. So as we are calculating uh, scores, uh, I just want to go around the table, especially to the mentors in terms of the conversations they had behind the scenes. So let's just do a quick 30 seconds for each mentor. Let's start with you, Suzanne, it was your team. And just share with us about your experience. Um, I'm actually very proud of my team. All of them didn't really quite have like marketing background, but they actually got this far. And their solutions are really very practical. I think it's something that you know SMEs can really take and run. So I'm really, really very proud of them. Yeah, well done. Let's go to Ed. Ed, Aline. Aline, you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm really proud of my team, also Team One. Um, so, kind of like building something from dancers to dancer. Um, I myself also grew up with like the old school generation. So I also like danced and skate when I was a bit younger. So not that I'm super old, but you know, that's maybe just a few years ago. I'm really proud of them for um, especially thinking both long term and short term because um, the dance market is a very saturated market. So I'm really glad that they came up with solutions to really innovate. And it's really great to see like the current generation of dancers really stepping up to find out um, what's more innovative and what works for their generation because um, it will always be different for uh, each one. 
yeah, so it was really great experience for me. And we can't hear you. Oh wait, it's me? <laughs> okay. Uh, I think it was a really refreshing experience to witness how the Gen, the Gen Z's perspective on business solutions. Because, you see, they are digital natives and uh, they are, I felt that they are the teams that I interacted with, their solutions right, are intoxicatingly social and immersive. Uh, of course, India had to pick the best team out of the three, but I think they did a very credible job given the fact that none of them have any medical background. I'm oh, sorry, any marketing background. They're all scientists, actually. Let's go to Ping Ping. Ping Ping, are you there? Okay, seems like Ping Ping can't connect with us. Uh, have I missed any other mentor? I can't see Leon here. All right, feel free to chime in mentors. Let's go uh, for a round for judges. And judges, we are compiling the score. So now is the last 10 seconds for you to put in your scores. Uh, let's, start, let's start with Vernia. So Vernia, how was your overall experience? I, I'm pretty blown away knowing that, you know, these um, people don't have um, marketing background. And obviously they came up with very sound marketing strategies. And these are really ideas that we have seen taken place in other brands and companies. So that, that's really good. Um, really want to commend the team that came up with the whole um, content idea. I think it was also the first eight team. Uh, I think it was great that, you know, you guys came up with like um, the idea of like doing your own brand content uh, to sort of attract new target audiences. So I think that's really good. Um, yeah, so that's all for me. All right, let's go to James. Yeah, I think um, some, some brilliant presentations. Uh, and, um, lots of well-structured, thought-through um, data insights, which is always great. Um, a big focus on customer. Um, lots of references to target segment, segments, which I always like to see. And, and really thinking through, you know, really important elements of sense of community. Um, bringing cultures together, um, you know, really important topics to be to be thinking about in the current climate. So yeah, I, I found um, all five of them really great presentations, and, and hard to believe um, these guys are um, are just kind of coming out of, of education. I think they'll get snapped up into the jobs market. It's brilliant. Awesome, Vishi. I think uh, just echoing what James said, uh, I was just reminiscing several decades ago when I was a student. And I can almost say for, with certainty that the quality of presentations that we see now is a lot more informed. I think it's a lot more grounded in data. Uh, it's a lot more um, uh, coherent in terms of presentation as well. I think uh, uh, so really well done uh, on, on the part of all teams. And, and to realize that some of them don't have the background in marketing and yet are able to do that, I think that is really commendable. And uh, uh, like especially right i think uh, the other good part for the students i would say is that you're working on real issues i think uh, so which is why the kind of impact that you can have uh, across different uh, smes i think is tremendous so really well done guys i think um, uh, you really deserve a big 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 uh, shout out and uh, well done vivek that's i think it's amazing work by all the teams um you know, I always believe that imagination is more important than knowledge. Uh, if you can imagine, you can reach there. Sometimes knowledge is a is a constraint, uh, constraining factor. It will stop you saying to suggest that you can't reach to a certain solution. Um, most of these solutions which have been given, they can be directly implemented to support the business in Singapore. Um, and I think great work by the mentors as well in simplifying the solution and putting them into a structure so you know, we can we can review these solutions. We can consume it, and possibly some of these ideas can can reach out to our SMEs in Singapore. So it's, I think overall well, and it's so difficult to pick up who's you know, which team is better, which is not. So um, which shows the kind of quality of solutions which have come out. And as Vishy was saying that you know when we were in college, 
or in the early stages of our career, we didn't think as broad, as creatively, and in such a structured way as, as these, uh, some of these solutions which have come out to be. So um, it's a great work by everyone and um, really, really great work by mentors because uh, it's complicated within a, such a short span of time to put a story together and support the team. Super work. Awesome. Let's go. Walter? Hi. Uh, what can I say? Actually, I'm very, very impressed. Uh, the creativity level is amazing, actually, considering these are all students fresh part of school actually and they have no experience whatsoever. Uh, the fact that they also didn't focus much on, on demographic you know, approach to marketing and also the, the different alternatives, processes and, and approach they have, I think it's mind blowing. When I was studying, I think the, the word data does not even exist. So the word digital marketing doesn't even exist. But <laughs> hearing from everyone about it, very centric, you know, it's like, it's like it's the new age now, everything is focused on digital marketing, everything is based on, on the importance of data. So it's amazing because all these case studies can actually be used now and, and, and run a actually profitable business with just a matter of tweaking here and there. And that to me is a great job to everyone. I'm really honored to be, to be a part of this and, and uh, looking forward to having you guys join us in the market soon. You're more than welcome. Thank you, Walter. And now time for the drum roll. We have the results. And interestingly, we have a tie. And tie is for second and third place. So we are going to be generous and we are going to give two second prizes. All right. So the second prizes are going for team six, Leon Esports, and team 11, Mentors Ed, Education and Training. This was for the first aid. And then you have the first prize winner, which is Eileen's team, Dance Studio. So drum roll again, guys. And <laughs> I guess you can bring it out. You can do a quick move for us if you want to. And congratulations, guys. Uh, having said that, um, the other two teams, really good job, as you see from the judges. And what is in store for you would be your work will be distributed to different associations. You have gotten the visibility from various organizations, including Scape and Icenthia, and we'll be looking at you as in the talent pool. Scape would be routing you through the fellowship program, so there's a win-win situation. And it's not about one to three, it's about one to five, and also to the larger teams who really prepared well. So thanks a lot, guys, for spending two and a half hours with us, patiently going through case studies, asking Q&A, and being very engaged. Over to you, Shirley, for some final remarks. Yes, totally. I am really very, very happy, to be honest. I can't stop uh, smiling. Okay, I, a few key takeaways for me. Uh, first, uh, like what most of the judges said, great depth in their research. You know, they really know how to use the Icentia uh, data, and that really gives very solid credential. I, I really like it. Um, and marketing is creative. I think really kudos to all the mentors to, to help them, you know, to come up with very innovative social media uh, campaign. You know, some of uh, the ideas, you know, and I'm just looking through, I could just imagine the mentors have actually injected a lot of ideas in there. And lastly, the overall idea is indeed actionable indeed practical. The, the reason why, you know, when we first uh, uh, incepted this idea and we talked to Brashan and team, we said that we really have to hack real business issues. And, and we came up with the five case studies is really to help our other tenants, our other partners. You know, as we speak, when we talk about dance, you know, I love uh, the, the team, they are all dancers. Please, I'll reach out to you guys, okay? Uh, wait for us to email to you. We will talk to you because I can see some of this helping our partners like old schools. Uh, likewise, for the retail and the restaurant portion, we do have, uh, you know, tenants at Scape. So they are very small. They are very small businesses. They need help. I think whether we can actually, you know, get you guys to be consultant of sorts, you know, we'll think of a way and we will support our tenants because I think the whole idea here is we want to really have a very good ecosystem that benefit everybody. So yes, we will reach out to you and, and the ideas of our internship is coming too. <laughs> and we will also talk to our partners. So kudos to everybody. And thanks judges for your, for your time. Really appreciate your, your valuable inputs. I think it helps them to re-pivot. I mean, they're always learning for all of us. Thank you so much. 
Okay, so before we close, time for a virtual photo. All right, okay. guys, so switch on your cameras and the dancers have to show us a move. And let's just take a quick screenshot. So Sabrina, Arun, Jenna, uh, really good work on the back end to really help the student data masterclass and everything. So let's take a screenshot. One, two, three. All right, guys, thanks a lot for your time. And it was a successful hackathon. We'll reach out to the winners and congratulations team. Thanks a lot, mentors, judges, and Skate. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.